Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining our first ever Thanksgiving Bake a for No Kid Hungry. I'm Carla Warner from Share Our Strength and the No Kid Hungry campaign, and I am thrilled to welcome you to this very special event. For many of us, the holidays is a time for baking, and luckily, it's one of the few things that won't change now that we're all grounded at home. But with that in mind, the holidays are also a time to give back. In the wake of the coronavirus, millions of children in the United States are going to suffer from poverty and hunger. In fact, one in four kids in the U.S. may suffer from hunger due to the coronavirus. The good news is No Kid Hungry is committed to ensuring that all children get the food they need during this time of struggle and well beyond. But we cannot do this important work without your support. That's what makes this holiday baking fun so truly special. We're gonna have fun, we're gonna bake, and we're gonna give back. Our event tonight is presented by award-winning chef Joe Ann Chang and from the amazing Gemma Stafford from Bigger Boulder Baking. We also have very special demonstrations by Brian Hart Hoffman of Bake From Scratch and Jocelyn Delk Adams of Grand Baby Cakes. Plus, we also have a few surprise videos for you. Each of our bakers will share with you their favorite baking recipes, some tips and techniques, and at the end, they will be answering some of your pressing baking questions. So be ready to post your questions in the chat when the time comes. We'll let you know when it's time for Q&A. So while we learn to up our baking game, we also hope you'll consider to make a donation to No Kid Hungry. Every dollar that we raise today can help connect a child to up to 10 meals. And if we hit our goal of 25,000, that could potentially unlock up to 250,000 meals for hungry kids across the country. So without further ado, I am very proud to introduce our first baker, who has been a committed supporter of ours for some time and also has played a pivotal role in this event today. She's baked in fabulous restaurants in Boston and New York and now owns the incredibly popular bakery and cafe Flower in Boston. I present you the very brilliant award-winning Joanne Chang. Hello, Carla. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the first ever Thanksgiving bake a to benefit No Kid Hungry. We hope this becomes an annual tradition. I want to tell you a little bit about the genesis of this. We were looking at all of the statistics about kids who are going hungry in America. Pre-COVID, it was one in seven, still not a great number. But post-COVID, that number has become one in four kids does not know where their next meal is coming from. And that's insane. So I reached out to Gemma Stafford of Bigger Boulder Baking, Better Boulder Baking, because I love how she bakes and I love her spirit and I love her zest for life. And she and her husband and business partner, Kevin, were thrilled to be able to join and do this Thanksgiving bake -thon. So she's gonna be coming on. We've got some guest, guest chefs and I wanted to help you all with some of your Thanksgiving baking with rolls. A lot of people love homemade rolls. So I wanted to show you how you can shape rolls. So let me get the computer so that you can see everything. So hopefully you can see the work surface. So this is a, a whole wheat dinner roll that recipe that we are posting on uh, on the stream so that you can see the recipe. But this is an amazing dinner roll that's filled with whole grains and there's also a little bit of butter and then we coat the whole thing in butter and also put some um, herbs on top, which I'll show you in a minute. But a lot of times people don't know how to actually shape rolls. So I wanted to give you a demo on how to shape rolls. So you can see that this dough has all been cut into, uh, these are all 75 gram pieces of dough. Now, you could just bake it like this, for sure, and you would still have really delicious rolls. But if you wanted something nice and round, I'm going to show you how you can actually shape the roll in, the, in your hand to create a beautiful top surface around the edge of the roll, and then when it bakes, it actually bakes off really beautifully, which I'll show you. So the first thing is you want to make sure you have a work surface that doesn't have a lot of flour on it, and you actually want dough that's a little bit sticky. So this dough is actually a little bit sticky. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the dough on the work surface. But I'm actually going to cage the dough in, the, in my hand just like this. Now as I'm caging it, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to push the dough forward. You can see it kind of rolling. Then I'm going to push it to the right. Then I'm going to push it back. And then I'm going to push it left. And as I'm doing this, I'm rolling this dough 
and I'm creating this really beautiful, let me do it and show you, this beautiful little dinner roll, which is gonna bake off beautifully. Now again, you can always just cut the dough and bake it like this, but if you want beautiful dinner rolls, you're gonna take the dough, you're gonna push it and let the friction of the work surface kind of push against the dough. Then you're gonna push it over to the right, push it back, push it over to the left, and just keep going round and round and round until you get this gorgeous roll. So when you get some practice, you can actually start doing this two-handed. And you go round and round and round. And again, the whole time, you're keeping the dough, the dough ball inside inside the cage of your hand, just like that. So again, push, 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 and the friction of the, the work surface with the bread will actually give you these beautiful rounds. So now I have this little tin. I'm gonna place the rolls in the tin. And now I'm actually going to give you a tour of our production kitchen. I'm going to put on my mask because there's a lot of people working here. But I think you can still hear me. So there's the rolls. And now let's go for a tour. Okay. So this is Kenny and Josh. They're shaping hundreds and hundreds of cranberry pecan rolls. So Josh has, you can see Josh, he's got the Duchess. What the Duchess is doing is splitting the dough evenly into 100 gram balls. And then you can see they've got all of these rolls. So here's some apple pies that we're baking now. And let me show you the rolls So these are those same rolls that I was just shaping, but they've actually been proofing now for about an hour. And now we have Isabel and Juan Carlos, and they are brushing the rolls with egg white. And then once they finish brushing the rolls with egg white, <laughs> They're gonna sprinkle. Did I get this? Yeah. <laughs> right? Did I do good? Did I do good? Okay, let me show you. Now I want to show you some of the baked rolls because they're so beautiful. This is Mike, and he's in charge of baking all of these rolls. You can see. So that gives you a sense of what the rolls look like when they're done. Okay, and I'm gonna give you one last visual because I wanna show you our ovens. We have these incredible ovens back here. These are called Mive ovens. They're actually so big, you can put in two rolling racks of food at a time. Whoa, very slippery. So here's some rolls that are ready to go into the oven. We have hundreds of bakers. Well, we used to have lots of bakers. Now we have dozens of bakers that are busy getting everybody ready for Thanksgiving. So I'm so happy that I was able to show you the rolls. And now I'm so excited to introduce you to Gemma. Gemma's going to be coming on. Hello, Gemma. Hi. How are Hi, you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm great. I have, first, I need to thank you. I want you to know how grateful I am to you and Kevin for helping stage this incredible production. This is so amazing. And hopefully we do this um, every year. I, I know, well, you know, a lot of this, um, Kevin is, uh, 
is behind a lot of this though like i really he pulled it all together and thank you joanna it was such a great idea um joanna i love seeing around the bakery because I, I follow you on instagram but i haven't really seen around the bakery yes it's a 6500 square foot production kitchen and that's where we do all of the mixing and shaping and baking yeah and um i love i i was i worked as a baker for a very long as a bread baker specifically for quite a long time so i used to be that person i'm not sure if you ever were this person up at two in the morning um shaping bread rolls just like dozens and dozens of them if not hundreds i was just <laughs> doing that it's so fun it's so satisfying to be able to shape the rolls and then watch them as they proof and grow and become really beautiful yeah yeah well they look gorgeous um so joanne tell me um, it's coming up to Thanksgiving. I have been watching your posts. Can you tell me, because I'm just kind of fascinated. I've seen the huge operation that you guys have there. What is the most popular dessert that you're selling right now? Is it something kind of traditional like an apple pie? Or is it something kind of, you know, not as traditional like a banana cream pie? Or is it even pie? Well, I would say typically if it's not for the holidays, uh, our most popular items are our chocolate chip cookie, our banana bread, our Oreos, and our sticky, sticky buns. Oh, now that it's yeah. Thanksgiving, oh, the, the sticky, sticky buns are so good. Now that it's Thanksgiving, um, we've actually had pumpkin pie on the menu all month long, and that is by far one of our most popular items. I think everybody looks forward to celebrating Thanksgiving, they look forward to the holiday season, and that first taste of pumpkin pie just gives you such nostalgia. And yeah. so that's been our top sellers for the last three weeks as we're gearing up towards Thanksgiving. Oh, nice. Do you have any kind of, is there anything uh, extra special about your pumpkin pie that you care to share? Yes. So one of the things we do is we actually cook down the pumpkin to reduce it a little bit to try to take out some of the liquid. And then we make up for the, the liquid with um, sweetened condensed milk and evaporated milk. And then we also have a bunch of different spices and we make sure that we cook it real, we bake the pumpkin pies really low and slow so that the yeah. custard is really creamy yeah that's actually you know i never thought about like reducing the pumpkin that's a really good idea getting more of a concentrated flavor exactly exactly it takes so, it takes you know for a small batch a home batch it probably only takes like 10 or 15 minutes but it really makes a difference oh wow I must try that. Um, I also actually recently I made a sweet potato pie, which like uh, for those of you who, who, um, who don't know me, I'm from Ireland. And so Thanksgiving is a relatively new ish holiday for me. I've been here for 12 years, but I made a sweet potato pie recently with a um, marshmallow kind of a meringue on top. And it was incredible. I've been wanting to do sweet potato pie for so long. We sometimes will do like a sweet potato casserole Oh, or yeah. roasted sweet potatoes with some marshmallows on top, which I think is very traditional Thanksgiving in, in America. Yeah, oh, I loved right. it, absolutely loved it. Um, speaking of Thanksgiving, Joanne, tell me what is um, one of, what was your role uh, in your Thanksgiving like festivities growing up? Do you have any kind of memory that really sticks out to you? So for me, you know, I grew up in a very, very traditional Taiwanese household. My parents immigrated here from Taiwan, and so we, adopted many thanksgiving traditions but the one thing that we never actually adopted was turkey so i never had turkey instead we had roast duck we my mom would get a roast duck from the you know the chinese roaster and we would make um peking duck pancakes and my job was always to actually make the pancakes for me my brother and my mom and my dad so the you don't the pancakes come as tortillas and then you take a little bit of hoisin you put some scallions, you take a little bit of the duck skin and a little bit of the roasted duck, and then you roll it up. And I was always the one who liked to like make little packets for everybody. So that was my role. That, I have to say, <laughs> I'm all about turkey, don't get me wrong, but that sounds absolutely delicious. I adore duck. And I think the reason I love it so much is just to get to that like fatty, nutty, crispy skin. Yes, I love that. I absolutely love that. And if you cook it so that it gets nice and crispy, it's almost like eating like um, almost like eating like a potato chip sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It's really crispy. It is when you render out that fast, like you just you, you like get it lovely and crispy, like you said. Joanne, um, what do the next two days look like for you there in Flower Bakery? So the next two days are going to be crazy, crazy busy. We're we're in the middle of it right now. We've baked off hundreds and hundreds of 
pecan pies, pumpkin pies, apple pies. We've got pear and cranberry crostata. We're making so many of these rolls, like thousands of these rolls. We've all been shaping rolls all day long. Um, and so it's 24, you know, it's around the clock starting uh, Sunday night and everybody is just baking, baking, baking. And then all tomorrow will be spent making sure that every bakery gets all of the orders that were pre-ordered. And so a lot of it ends up being like a logistics game. So I will have in my car, I will have two of every single item and I'll basically be at the ready. If somebody says, oh my gosh, you know, somebody came in for their, their pear crostata and we don't have one, then that's my go time. And I'm like, okay. So we have two or three of us who have cars filled with extra food. And our job is just to drive around Boston and Cambridge to make sure everybody oh gets gosh. their orders. You're kind of every like Noah's Ark. Instead of animals, you've got food of every pie. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And every year, it's like we start off the day saying, everything's going to be perfect. Everyone's going to have everything. And inevitably, there's someone yeah. who's like, uh oh, I've run out of gravy. And so there we go. But it's really fun. It's really fun to see all of our guests. Um, we've been open for 20 years. And so we wow. have guests who've been ordering Thanksgiving from us, you know, for the last 20 years. And it's it really is an honor just to be part of their celebration and to be able to see them year in and year out. That's amazing. Well, for those of you um, who don't know Joanne, she is an amazing bakery in Boston, Flower Bakery. And I think right now she is probably feeding a lot of homes uh, uh, around that area. We are very excited. Yes. Joanne, it was lovely to talk to you. It's so lovely to talk to about you. the rules. <laughs> I know we, we finished with these rolls and now we're going on to the cranberry pecan and then we'll do some multi-grain and it's just going to be rolls, rolls, rolls all day long. Nice. That sounds great. Um, it, well, I, I might see you again later, Joanne. Absolutely. I'm excited to talk with you a little bit later when you show us the, all of your pie crust tips. Yeah, I've got loads of them. <laughs> I hope Excellent. I have a long enough time. I think we might send it back to Carla now, will we? Fabulous. So good to talk with you, Gemma. Hi, Carla. How are you? This is amazing. I have to eat rolls and rolls now. But before we talk about that, I want to open it up to our viewers to be able to ask you some of their question baking questions. So for those of you watching, if you have questions for Joanne, now is the time to put them into chat and I will happily read them. So let's see what we've got. All right, I think we'll start with Joanne. What is your favorite type of pie? So my favorite pie that we make every year for Thanksgiving and for Christmas is our pear and cranberry crostata. It's a free form crostata. Um, basically we take a really flaky pie dough we roll it out into like 12 or 14 inches. And then we spread a nice thick layer of frangipan, which is an almond cream. Um, and so we spread that in the middle. Then we roast pears with ginger, lots of ginger, lots of butter, lots of sugar. And we roast them until they get nice and caramelized. Then we take those pears and we uh, put a layer of pears on the bottom. And then we take a handful of fresh cranberries and put that on top of the pears. And then put another layer of pears on top. And then another handful of fresh cranberries. And then we just make a really simple crostata by folding up the sides. And so you fold up the sides and kind of make pleats. And as it pleats, it creates this really beautiful pattern. And then we let it sit for um, at least overnight because you really want everything to relax a little bit before you bake it. And then we bake it until it's nice and golden brown. And that is my favorite thing that we make. It is you know, so good. I love it. incredible. And you know what I love about crostata? I feel like it's a free season of dessert. Right, it's like you could do that in the in the fall, and then you could put peaches and blueberries in the spring and summer. Right, it's just an exactly. dessert. I love it. But I've never yeah, had it. Here. So flexible. So yeah, flexible. that's so great. Okay, another question from our audience is, um, what do you like better, Thanksgiving or the December? Holiday? Say that again. What do I like? What do you like better, Thanksgiving or the December holiday? Oh, I love Thanksgiving. Um, I love any holiday that is centered around eating. <laughs> and so it is, a thanks, it is a holiday where everybody can come together. Um, I love just spending the day planning the meal, 
and then prepping the meal and then having the meal and then relaxing after the meal. But I also love that it is a holiday that everybody can participate in. Um, it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your religion is or what your upbringing was. To spend a day to just be thankful for whatever you have in your life, I think is a, is a pretty special uh, holiday. Um, and I love just the, the whole idea of as we're gearing up towards Thanksgiving, because of the actual word, you know, you're, you're, you're thanking and you're giving, it really puts you in the mindset of what I think is so important in life, which is connecting with people around you and being grateful for everything that you have and being thankful and trying to give back. Um, it, honestly, it's one of the reasons why I'm so, uh, so much a part of No Kid Hungry. You know, I learned about No Kid Hungry when I was a baby little line cook. I was like a little line cook at a restaurant and I didn't know anything and my chef took me to um, a Taste of the Nation fundraiser. And I just you know, started to learn more and more about the organization and about how the goal was just so simple. You know, let's just end childhood hunger in America. And as a naive young young cook, I was like, wow, you know, there's, there's that much childhood hunger that we need to have like this big organization to end it. And sure enough, I, as the more I learn, the, the sadder it gets, but also the more hopeful I get, because I know that this organization is so committed to doing everything we can as a community, as a, as a country, as a nation, to raise money and help those who need it. Um, and what I love about it too is that the food is out there. I think that's what struck me when I first learned about No Kid Hungry. We're not raising money to go out and purchase food to feed, feed kids. The food is there. There are programs that exist for hungry kids. What we're doing with No Kid Hungry is connecting the hungry kids to the programs. Because unfortunately, red tape has gotten in the way and sometimes the hungry kids don't know how to get the programs. And I think now with COVID, I think we can all agree that you know if kids aren't going to school, then how the heck are they going to be able to get their free meals? And so that's what No Kid Hungry is all about, trying to figure out you know, how, to, how to answer that question. Great. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate everything that you do for us. We have a few more questions if you're up for it. Um, we, I, we talked about what your favorite uh, dessert was. So one of the questions was, what would be on your table? So I think you answered that with the first note um, But what is the best publication? What are the best tips for puff pastry? Oh, the best tips for puff pastry. Okay, so puff pastry, for those of you who are not um, bakers, is a pastry that's made with, um, you just make a dough, which is flour and water, and maybe a little bit of fat and a little bit of sugar. And then you have butter, a layer of butter. And you take the layer of dough and the layer of butter and you basically fold them one on top of another. And you keep folding them and folding it in half and then folding that half in half. And you keep doing that so that you create these layers of butter dough, butter dough, dough, butter dough, dough, butter dough. And what happens to all of those layers is the butter, when you, when you roll out puff pastry, when it goes into the oven, all of the, the moisture that's in the butter, the water, that water naturally is in butter and it turns to steam and then it causes your puff pastry to rise and become really flaky. So the best puff pastry is melt in your mouth. It's flaky, you take a, a fork to it and it just like melts in your mouth and it shatters. So the tips to making a great puff pastry, you want your dough and your butter to be at the same temperature. You want them to be at the same texture. So that when you're rolling out the puff pastry and doing all of the folds and the turns, which allow you to create the layers, if everything is of the same texture, no dough or no butter is going to shoot out the side or smear or melt or get too tough. And so you're really trying to maintain the integrity of the dough layers and the butter layers. So touch the dough, touch the butter. If they feel about at the same consistency, then you're ready to roll. And be patient. That's another thing with puff pastry. It just takes a little time. Sometimes you want to rush it, but be patient and you'll make a great puff pastry. That's fantastic. Well, Joanne, thank you so much. It has been so incredible to have you with us today. So we're going to let you jump away. We know you're going to be back, but this was an amazing presentation. I will be back. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for supporting No Kid Hungry. Great. Okay, so everybody who's watching, um, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. We are big 
bread eaters at my house, so I will definitely be making those rolls this week. Um, please know that all of the recipes from our bakers today will be posted on our website, which is nokidhungry.org forward slash bakeathon. And that also happens to be the place where you can make a donation to help feed hungry kids. Remember that every dollar that we raise today can help connect children to up to 10 meals. These are extraordinary times for our nation's children, and it's going to require extraordinary generosity. Through emergency grants, expert guidance, and advocacy, No Kid Hungry is working with communities nationwide to help feed all the kids who need it. Your support is what's making this possible. So coming up, we will have special demonstrations by Brian Hart Hoffman of Bake From Scratch and Jocelyn Delk Adams of Grand Baby Cakes. And we're then gonna conclude with a presentation, of course, from Gemma Stafford of Bigger Boulder Baking. And remember, all of our bakers will be dedicating time, just like we did with Joanne at the end, to answer some of your pressing questions. But before we move on, I'd like to share a surprise video from a very special guest. So friends, take it away. Hi everyone, Candace Nelson here. I'm the founder of Sprinkles and also uh, the host of the podcast, Live to Eat. I also just launched a course called the Pie Pop-Up. So for those of you who are looking for some instruction on pie, check it out. I am so excited to welcome you today to the first ever Thanksgiving Bakeathon for No Kid Hungry. No Kid Hungry is an incredible organization that I've worked with throughout the years, myself personally, and uh, through my restaurant, Pizzana, and they are doing incredible work helping feed kids who are food insecure. And now, as you know, is the, it's more dire than ever with this pandemic raging. There are more kids who are going hungry. And the work that No Kid Hungry does, it has such a multiplier effect. With $1, they can feed a kid 10 meals. So I really urge you guys to give what you can today. It's the holiday season, it's the time of giving, and your money goes really, really far. So the holiday season is also a time for baking. And I know we are all sort of hands deep in pie dough right now, baking up those incredible Thanksgiving pies. And I say, take the stress off yourself for the day of, make your pie dough in advance. Make your pie dough today. Pie dough can sit in the fridge for two, I've even let it go three days. Um, and then it's all ready for you to roll out and bake up either the day before or the day of Thanksgiving. So, you know, if you want to make it even before next year, you can make it even a month in advance and put it in the freezer wrapped really well, and then just let it thaw in the fridge uh, the night before. So I'm wishing everyone an incredible Thanksgiving. Eat well, give what you can, and see you soon. All right. Wow. Thank you so much, Candice, for that really great video and super smart tip. I will never forget the first time I baked a pie dough. It was uh, to bring home to the family of my now husband, and it was the ugliest thing I think I've ever baked. So if you are a novice like I was those many years ago, don't give up. I think over time with practice, you will get there. Um, we are so grateful today for all of the bakers who are participating in this event and really for all the chefs who have supported the No Kid, no Kid Hungry campaign since the beginning. And thanks to our generous viewers today, I am excited to share a fundraising update that says that we have raised $220 so far. So thank you all for those of you that were very generous donated. Um, we are continue on, um, but we hope for those of you who have not yet had a chance to give that you will go to nokidhungry.org forward slash bakeathon to help us hit that goal. So let's continue with our baking education. I'm so pleased to now introduce the next extremely talented baker whose baking memory started when he was only nine or 10. Since then, he's founded one of my favorite baking magazines, Bake From Scratch. Take it away, Brian Hart Hoffman. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I am so excited to join this very first ever Thanksgiving Bakeathon. And I am actually not in my home kitchen. So you can see that I am in a rental that I am spending a little bit of time away. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop baking. Um, so before I share a recipe with you, I want to offer a baking donation challenge to everyone watching right now that during the next 30 minutes while I am doing a demonstration and spending time with you, 
I am pledging up to $500 in matching of your donation. So even if it's as little as $1 or go ahead and donate $500, I am going to get in and match donations up to $500 at the end of my time with you today. Because the reason we're spending time here is not just to bake with you. We love baking. But one thing that I have committed myself to is baking the world a better place. And that starts with a, a program that's amazing, like No Kid Hungry. Bake From Scratch has had the pleasure to feature No Kid Hungry in our very first magazine that we published five years ago. We have gone on to host bake sales for No Kid Hungry. I have participated in fundraisers with William Sonoma. Bob's Red Mill, and an, another you know, long list of organizations that support the efforts to end childhood hunger. I've served on the board of a food bank in Birmingham, Alabama, where I'm from, and I really feel so connected to our mission that if we are spending time in our kitchens baking delicious foods and desserts, then we should be spending time ending childhood hunger with the same passion that we spend time in the kitchen. So that donation challenge is alive right now. You've got 35, 30 minutes or so. Heck, I'm going to make sure that we get that $500 donated. So please start your donating and I am going to start baking. So I told you a minute ago that I'm not in my kitchen and that means I don't have a lot of equipment and I didn't know what would be waiting on me here at this house that I'm renting. So you see a little bit of random uh, stuff on the counter and I'm gonna talk you through my methodology. When I arrived, I walked in and thought, I need to bake something so that the bake-a-thon can happen and I'm not just standing and not offering any baking tips. But I think this is a good way to talk about what happens when we do travel and we still have that urge to bake. So I took inventory and I gotta tell you, there's not a lot here. I'm working with this one measuring cup and you guys, this is it. The rest of what you see, I've had to do a lot of eyeballing and guesswork. So I thought I need to find a recipe that fits the flexibility of where I am. And my friend David Leibovitz has an amazing recipe for a French apple tart on his website. He lives in France and it has so many uh, methods involved that give flexibility to the baker. And in this case, I'm going to have to take his recipe and make it my own in this kitchen since I don't have a lot of equipment. So <laughs> you can see I'm using like dishes from the cupboard, but I did snag a, a glass tart pan. I would normally be using a metal uh, nonstick tart pan, but I found one at the grocery and I'm going to use it today. Um, and I also just want to talk about the fact that uh, in baking, we strive to have amazing results all the time. And for me, this was a big adjustment to not have a scale in the kitchen to weigh my ingredients and the precision that I normally bring. Um, I call myself an OCD baker. So this has been a stretch. I did um, make a tart yesterday that I'll show you in a minute. So I know that this is going to work. Um, but I will start by telling you that thankfully there was a, a little salad spinner in the drawer that I'm going to use as a mixing bowl so that we can get started with our tart dough. So I am starting with unsalted butter. This is six tablespoons and it is guesswork cubed room temperature butter. And the way that I guessed my, uh, my volume to make sure that I was pretty accurate was the package of butter was 250 grams and I needed 85 grams, which is roughly one third. So I cubed one third of the butter packet. So you can see we're starting out with a little bit of the guesswork that I was telling you about. And then to this, I'm adding granulated sugar and I was able to get a nice measurement for that. And you guys, I'm just using a spatula here and I am incorporating the room temperature butter with the sugar. And I'm just stirring until it's combined. David's recipe is so nice. It does call for a stand mixer, but you're not creaming the butter and sugar until fluffy. You're just combining them fully before we add other ingredients. And it's like four or five ingredients for this dough. And then I'll show you something else that I love about it. But I do have to say for a second that Joanne really did inspire me. Um, I was just Googling recipes for duck earlier because I think that that's going to be something I make at Christmas time. 
Um, so Joanne, I'm going to be sending you some, some messages to inquire about uh, recipes and how I can have beautiful duck at home as well. So I have my butter and sugar mixed in my plastic bowl with my spatula and I'm adding one egg yolk that's room temperature. And I always bake with room temperature eggs unless specified in the recipe, but you can see it combines so nicely into the butter mixture. So I'm trying to show you and do it at the same time. I hope you're donating. All right, I'm gonna keep checking in to see. I'm gonna look at the comments too along the way to see if I need to stop and talk about anything, but I hope you're donating while I mix them. All right, so now I'm just gonna put a little bit of salt. I think the recipe calls for an eighth of a teaspoon. And you should be using salt every time you bake because it enhances the flavor. It doesn't make your baked goods savory. It just brings out the sweetness and the flavors of what you're using. And then I'm adding all-purpose flour. And you guys, the all-purpose flour one, that one was tough for me because I used that, that large measuring cup I was showing you. And I really believe in the weight measurement for flour because it's so hard to scoop and get accurate measurements. But I'm just continuing with this spatula and bringing this tart dough together. And with the room temperature butter and the egg, you're gonna to start to see the mixture come together in clumps in the bowl. And I hope you're inspired to see that when you're traveling, you can, you can make anything work. Um, you know, I, I always think I'm gonna take baking supplies in my suitcase, but uh, that's not always the case, especially today. But I'm glad that there was some equipment here in the house that I could use. So as the mixture comes together, you can see that it's a little bit crumbly in the bowl. And David says that if that's the case, you can add just a little bit of water to the mixture, just so you get everything absorbed. And then he also uses his hands. And I talk about this a lot in baking, that your hands are the best tool. So I'm just using my hands here to lightly toss everything together and make sure that the butter, here I'll move back so that you can see what I'm doing, that the butter and the flour mixture are coming together. And I can start to see clumps that when I press them together, they hold consistency. So I'm just gonna get everything brought together here and scrape around the sides of the bowl. So if you're in the comment section or asking questions, fire away as we bake together. And I've got the dough coming together beautifully here with just a few crumbs left in the bottom of the bowl. And I'm just gonna press together in my hands before transferring it to the tart plate. Now, I did use a light coating of butter on the tart, paint, on the tart plate because I think the glass was causing it to stick a little bit yesterday, where normally using my nonstick tart pans at home that are metal, you would not have the sticking, so I wouldn't butter that, but I did feel like I needed to do that for this recipe. Okay. Here's my favorite part about this recipe. You do not need a rolling pin, and I shouldn't press it in yet. David says to form your dough into a disc, and you can just see how easy this dough is to work with, and start pressing into the bottom and up the sides of the tart pan. Now it's sticking to my hands a little bit, so I do wanna get a little bit of the flour mixture that was left behind, and just continue to press into and around the tart pan. So if you're watching, I hope that you're having a nice aha moment, that you don't have to have a rolling pin, you don't need any fancy equipment if the dough is nice like this. Now this dough reminds me of working with a Gatto Basque recipe that we have in Bake From Scratch, it's on our website. And that recipe, you it really is almost like a sugar cookie dough. And this reminds me of that as well. Um, so I'm just pressing. And this pan is a little bit larger than the one that David calls for in his recipe. So I am gonna get just a little bit of flour for my hand. And I always have flour nearby when I'm baking so that if it's sticking, I'm able to use just a little bit of flour to prevent sticking in the tart pan. Some of the areas of the dough are just a little bit sticky from that room temperature butter but I'm just pressing into and around the pan. So 
a little pinch bowl on the side will help to prevent that sticking if you've added even just a little bit too much water. Just, it's such a forgiving dough, I love it. And then you're just gonna press into the bottom and up the sides of the pan. And this is also reminiscent to me of a galette as well, a free form pie dough. And I know Gemma is gonna talk about pie dough a little bit later. And I really love free form. And I love this style here too. I didn't need to worry about chilling the dough for you know, even 30 minutes or an hour and then rolling it. I'm just using my hands, getting a nice even consistency and then pressing. Once I get all the way around, I'm gonna start pressing up the sides. And then this would normally go in the refrigerator for about, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes just to get nice and chilled again with the butter. But today I'm going to skip that step so that I can keep this demonstration going. But I hope you see just how easy this recipe is. And now I'm just using my fingers and pressing the dough up the sides to form a nice side crust. And again, this is such a forgiving dough that I'm just pressing to get an even consistency, but I can come back around and do the same thing again, just patting all the way around the sides. And, you know, really when I started thinking about this recipe, I was reminded a few years ago, we were traveling um, to celebrate my mom's 60th birthday in Vermont. And she woke up one day and said, I'm going to make an apple crisp. And I said, well, what ingredients do we have? And she was talking about, oh, I've got some spices and we can get some flour and apples and, and the rest will be history. And with my niece and nephew, she brought together one of the most beautiful apple crisps in minutes. And it really stood out in my mind of just how great apples are to work with, but then using it in this French apple tart that I love. So you can see I've just pressed into the bottom of the pan and then up the sides to form a beautiful crust. And that is that. I'm just gonna wash my hands really quickly before I whisk together the filling. And you're donating, right? While I'm cleaning my hands, let's take a minute to think about the children right now that because of the challenging year that we have all been in together, and they are facing food insecurities. And while I talk about having a beautiful apple tart, there are families that don't have enough food this week for their holiday meal or just for a meal, period. So I want you donating. Please, I will match up to $500 during the next few minutes while I'm with you. And I really want to Make sure you're not just thinking about your own holiday. We wouldn't be gathered here for this event if that was the case. We are thinking about others right now so that we are putting food on other people's tables while we are also creating recipes to celebrate with our friends and family as well. So you're donating. And I am ready to make this filling that is so easy. We'll start with four apples that I have cored and just sliced into, uh, just sliced. I do not like peeling apples and I really don't have a sharp enough knife here to do that. So I am baking these with the, the apple peel on. It kind of gives you the freedom to do what you want. Um, if you're baking with a Honeycrisp or a Pink Lady apple, those are the best for baking. Um, and just make sure you're using an apple that's gonna hold its structure. And I, yeah, I don't peel apples very often. <laughs> that can be part of the, the great debate as we continue our time together today, whether you peel your apples always or whether you're like me and you're looking for a little bit of an easy solution. That's right, I'm bringing in a little bit of rum. We're gonna talk about that in a second. But first, let me put the, well, actually I'll make the filling and then I'm gonna put the apples in. So I'm starting with two eggs in this beautiful uh, like noodle bowl that was here in the house. And to that, I'm adding granulated sugar and I'm just gonna whisk these together. Thankfully, there was a whisk here or else you could use a fork. You know, you gotta modify wherever you go. So I'm just whisking these together until they're combined. And then I'm gonna add vanilla extract, just eyeballing about three fourths a teaspoon, a pinch of salt, 
and I'm gonna get this nice and combined. And David's recipe calls for Calvados, which is a French apple brandy from Normandy. So this is like a Normandy um, style apple tart. Um, but today I don't have Calvados. So I am using a vanilla rum. So this is me making it my own. And I'm using about two and a half tablespoons. And if you don't wanna bake with the alcohol in this tart, you can use more vanilla extract and it will still be amazing. So I'm just getting the rum whisk in. And then I'm adding heavy cream. You could also use half and half here. And this is so easy. I mean, this is when I realized I could bake today and have a recipe that I'm proud of. And I'm really proud to bake from my friend David's website. Um, he's been so supportive of Bake From Scratch and we have published some of his recipes. He's featured ours, so it's great today to be able to, to make his recipe. All right, so did you keep up with that? That's the filling. We're ready to put it in the tart pan. So taking your apple slices, you're just gonna start laying them in the crust, just fan them out in a pattern and go around in a beautiful pattern that gives a nice wow factor when this comes out of the oven. And you'll see just before we even take it to the oven how beautiful it is. So I try to keep the apples in their sections from where I sliced so that they can fit nicely next to each other. But you're just looking for a beautiful assembly of your apples. And if you wanted to be a little bit more free form here, I think this is where my OCD factor comes in that I'm wanting everything to line up perfectly. You don't have to do that. You could lay them in and it's meant to be a rustic bake. Um, so don't, don't feel like you need to panic about that. So just put these in the pan and I'm obviously spending so much time talking. I hope you're donating while I'm talking. Um, but I'm just getting these apples in now. And I'm gonna try to speed myself up a little bit so that we can get to questions and chat and see where we are in our donation tally. So I'm just gonna put a few more apples in and then I'll show you just how easy this is. Once you have your apples in, I'm gonna give this just a quick final whisk to make sure all of the ingredients are combined. And then you just pour it over the apples until the filling is nice and in right in the tart shell, almost covering the apples. And then I found some vanilla sugar in the grocery store, but if you don't have any of this, you can use turbinado sugar or granulated sugar and just sprinkle it over the apples and your filling. And it's gonna put a beautiful caramelization on the top. You'll get a nice crispy edge on some of the apples. And then of course, just that beautiful flavor you get from that sugar topping. So this would bake in a 350 degree oven for about 45 minutes to 50 minutes. You just want the filling to be set and the top to be nice and golden. And I, I did eat some of this already, but I'm gonna show you, let me see if I can get in the light. Some of the slices that you get the beautiful apple texture, the nice rustic edge on your tart, it bakes so beautifully. Sorry, the lighting is giving me a little bit of trouble. I'll get by the window so you can see. But it is such a beautiful and easy tart. So if you're traveling or you just want something simple and the flexibility to kind of use the equipment available to you, grab this recipe. It is online with the event information and you see how easy it is to adapt using rum or using Calvados or anything that you feel like using. Um, David does address in his comments that most people ask, why didn't we add any cinnamon? And it's not very common in French baking with apples to add cinnamon the way it is in American baking, but it would bake beautifully with cinnamon. So if you want to put a dusting of cinnamon or toss your apples in some cinnamon before putting them in the tart, you can definitely do that too. So that is an easy French apple tart, but that's not why we're here. We are here to end childhood hunger, and I wanna know how the donations are coming in. Gemma, are you there for us to chat about this? I'm here. Can you see me? Yes, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm doing great. Brian, that uh, tart looks absolutely gorgeous. 
Well, we can thank David for that. I just took the liberty to make it something that would work in a modified environment. So, yeah. you know, but we yeah, all need a solution. So Brian, um, I I uh, I just wanted to say um, a huge thank you for being a part of uh, our very first Bake Us On. It was a pleasure to have you. And even though you're in a bit of a compromised spot right there, with not a lot to um, bake with, you did amazing. Thank you. You know, I think it was like the mission of the week when I got here and I thought, okay, let's see what equipment is in the kitchen. We all have those moments that we we've, we've got to have something on the table, or you just have that urge to bake. And you go in and think, I can figure this out. So I'm glad, yeah, yeah. I'm glad it worked. As they say, needs must. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's an Irish thing. I think that's an everybody thing, right? I, yeah, I, I, I don't say it. Maybe it is an Irish thing, Gemma. <laughs> and I just have to say, I heard you earlier talking about the sweet potato pie. And yeah. I sent you a text the mm -hmm. second I saw it. That is a Southern pie yeah. tradition in my family. And we I taught mine with meringue. And I saw that you did the same thing. Yeah. So, so that made me happy. A huge. I have to say, I'm going to put it out there and say that originally I wasn't all for it. Um, but then when we made it and um, with the meringue on top, I mean, it seals the deal. It was absolutely gorgeous. Do we have any questions or anything coming in that we can chat about? Let's see. Um, do we have any questions or anything? We just, we'll keep chatting. And uh, I think they're going to have some questions coming in. Yes. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Well, um, if any of you guys at home um, have any questions for us about um, Brian's recipe, about pie crust, about the um, apples that he used, whatever it is, or just Thanksgiving in general, we are two days away now. So it's not very long. And of course, as Brian mentioned, don't forget to donate. And there's going to be a link in the description box for that. Brian. Um, I, as much I know we're best friends and everything, but um, I heard you were going to match five hundred dollars of the of up to sorry up to five hundred dollars donation. Yeah, I am. I well, are go you? Ahead. No, go you ahead. go ahead. I, well, I, I was as as much as good friends we are. I, I don't want to be outdone, so <laughs> we are also going to match five up to five hundred dollars. Also, <laughs> yay! I figured we could start a thing here in the baking friend community. That's amazing. You know I'm competitive, right? I wasn't going to let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, do I tell you beforehand or wait until we get in here? I did send you a message though, so you knew what I was thinking. Yeah. And again, I just, I know that so many people are modifying their plans this week and families may not be gathering, you know, with 10 and 20 people, which I hope they're not, if, if we're listening to the guidance, uh, we, we've got to be so careful right now. But I would encourage people to think about the money that they would normally spend on a Thanksgiving dinner for their family. So maybe it is 250, maybe it's $300. And if you're not doing that this year, donate it to No Kid Hungry. Let that money go further and we can help impact communities that are really in need and food insecure households where children may not be in schools right now because of certain areas that are still in restriction, we've got to make sure we're getting help to the children and families that are food insecure. So yeah, absolutely. You know, more than and what we're doing today, we've got to do our part to end the hunger. And for those at home, um, just so you know, $1 is equal equals 10 meals, which is really incredible. So you think about your turkey, Brian, but then I think about the cup of coffee that I spent $5 on. And um, I'm not going to be doing that this week. Uh, because you know, like, definitely, there's a lot of us out there that can make a big difference. And no okay, kid hungry, definitely do that. And I've been partnering with them for a few years. And I know you have too, yeah. and Candace and Joanne and and um, it's, re it's really important, especially around the holidays that people don't get forgotten about. And, you know, I think we as, you know, not just food professionals or passionate bakers or, you know, anyone in business in the food space, I just don't believe we can be profiting when we're not helping on the other side. If we're in business, we've got to make sure we're supporting the organizations like No Kid Hungry so that we're doing our part and not just being in the food business. We've got to be in the business of feeding everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it comes full circle. I, I, I absolutely agree. Absolutely. So, Brian, sorry, go ahead. No, I just was agreeing with you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
Um, so, Brian, tell me, um, growing up, what was, uh, tell me like a Thanksgiving memory that like stands out to you, like growing up in your family? So, you know, I before I was in the baking industry, I was a flight attendant. So mm -hmm. I was away from my family for a number of years. Being a junior flight attendant, you work every holiday, you're taking people to their families, but you're not with yours. Um, and I'll never forget that first Thanksgiving, my mom and grandparents and family said, we're waiting on you to come home because whenever we're together, that will be when we celebrate holidays. Oh. And I'll never forget the way I felt that it's not necessarily a day on the calendar. And when you look at a year like this, when we're not with our families and we can't have those big gatherings, we know we will one day soon. And that's when we can celebrate and make up for all the birthdays and all the holidays we've missed. And it just, the way it made me feel that they were gonna wait on me for that celebration was so special. Um, and then a few years later, my mom and dad and my brother actually flew with me on Thanksgiving to Newark, New Jersey, where we stayed at uh, a, a, a less than five-star hotel near the airport. And they came and joined me where we had basically like, you know, whatever the restaurant had at 10 p.m. Thanksgiving dinner. So just modified celebrations. And, and you know, there's a lot of people in that this year, too. So it's whenever we can celebrate and be with the people we love. That's lovely. That is so lovely. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, I get the feeling from people Thanksgiving has a little, there's a little bit of a different feel and vibe around Thanksgiving compared to Christmas. Um, but, and I've only been here, I've been in the United States now for 12 years. So I've done a few Thanksgivings and there's just something different about the holiday. And, you know, there's, there's no gift giving traditionally. So it is definitely about coming together and spending it with the ones uh, that are closest to you. And the fact that you're like family, you know, celebrated, ways to celebrate with you, like in person, like in Newark, which like, is just absolutely lovely. That's so, that's a really lovely story. Yeah. So just, you know, I, I now believe that the date on the calendar is not the day you have to do anything. And I think it's probably fit the theme for 2020 in the most yeah. applicable way is we modify, but it doesn't mean that we're not family. It doesn't mean we can't celebrate. And just because it's not the day on the calendar doesn't mean it's any less special to get together when we can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Brian, what is what do the next two days look like for you? Are you going to be cooking, baking? I'm gonna do a like light, light cooking. You know, I I I have to say, just even making this tart, I'm gonna bake this one in a minute and finish this other one <laughs> uh later on. That is for me just having that small kind of comfort of something sweet. Um, and then you know, I, I have to agree with Joanne that the turkey is just not like a craving thing of mine. So I, and maybe steak on the grill. I think it's okay. going to be steak on the grill. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. We already here. So our, our Thanksgiving, we canceled our Thanksgiving plans. And uh, we're going to spend it at home with uh, Kevin, my husband and baby George. But I went to the store and I, I got um chicken or sorry not chicken i got turkey wings and uh drumsticks and i confit them so i'm after um confiting them in like some oil and duck fat and everything like that oh. and they're sitting over to the side waiting for thursday so we're gonna kind of we're going to make it up a little bit we're gonna have some traditional sides like we are having turkey but it's a little bit different and uh you know there's only the two of us so i'm going to try and make a normal amount of food for two people, but I already know that I'm 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 feeding an army. It's easy to want to like that Thanksgiving inclination is to like just bake and make and cook so many things. Um, I I am craving two things though that I think I'm going to take a stab at, and that's just uh, like a very simple macaroni and cheese. I mm -hmm. I was reading a recipe um, from Deb Perlman on Smitten Kitchen, uh, a recipe that you don't boil the noodles; you just put them in. Yeah. The dish, you put cheese, you put the dairy, and then you cover it with foil and bake it and then uncover it and it continues bubbling away. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try in my modified space to <laughs> pull that off. 
And then I've also bought, um, I bought a big brioche that I'm letting, um, I'm letting it stale so that yeah. I can make some stuffing. Um, oh, nice. That's not, so the Southern Thanksgiving is a cornbread dressing. And for everyone watching, <laughs> I hope my family's at home now shaking. Their head. <laughs> I don't love cornbread dressing. Um, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm right here um, for No Kid Hungry and everyone watching and donating. Um, I fell in love with stuffing when I was living in Pennsylvania and cranberries and herbs and leeks and all that just in there with the the bread. I'm I'm gonna take a stab at that this week too. So yeah. That's Joel, I think when it comes to like the sides, I think I think I'm not alone here when it comes to the sides for Thanksgiving. That's generally like what I load up on, like potatoes, stuffing. Yeah. My mom makes this um, amazing for Christmas, makes an amazing, amazing sausage stuffing where she puts sausage meat in there and a lot of sage. And then you mentioned like buttered leeks and things like that. Yes. Oh my gosh, absolutely delicious. See, it is the time you, you start craving. <laughs> like, then now my brain's going to think like, oh, what are the five other things I'm going to have to make too? And then there's just two of us. So I, yeah. I need to like pump the brakes on that, you know? Yeah. Stick to the stick to the rose and the and the, and the macaroni and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> stick to the rose and whatever happens after that is just fine. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. Brian, it was great to talk to you. I think we're going to uh, shoot it back over to Carla. Thank you so much for sharing that recipe. It's absolutely gorgeous. And thanks uh, for being thank a part of Bakeathon. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy I was able to join. All right, Brian, first and foremost, wow, for your very generous offer to match gifts up to $500. That is truly incredible. And then Gemma coming in and doing the same, I'm sure inspired by you. So thank you wholeheartedly, not just for, for being a part of this event from the Caribbean, making your way through that foreign kitchen, um, but also for your incredible generosity. We are so thankful for you. Um, and what an amazing presentation. Well, I'm glad I was able to modify and bake and still have something to share. And I think, you know, it was a good reminder for me that we're not always in the perfect scenario with stand mixers and rolling pins and all of our equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a fun one to do. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I'm thrilled to now be able to ask you some questions from our viewers. So awesome. one of the questions that surfaced a couple of times, including from our co-founder, Debbie Shore, was what type of apples do you use when you make this tart? So these apples, and David has a really great guide for how to select apples from the market. And being where I am, I am, I was kind of like a stab in the dark on which kind of apples to use. So thankfully, David showed an icon that is next to the different apples in the market. So I was able to select some baking apples that are perfect. If you're shopping in the American market, Honeycrisp and Pink Lady apples are my favorite to bake with. Um, and if you, you know, I think even on bakefromscratch.com, we have a guide to apples, choosing the ones for baking. Certain pies call for Granny Smith. You know, you're just wanting an apple that will hold shape when baking. It doesn't want to turn to mush and, and you know, make the experience less than delicious and amazing. Um, <laughs> and then you want it to also have really good flavor that complements the sweetness of other things. So um, so that's how I choose apples. And David was a really good guide for me here, too. <laughs> good, good. OK, so Sophia asked if there's a substitute that you use for condensed milk. For condensed milk? That's a tough one. I know we're going to get stumped. I knew there'd be something that stumps me. Um, you know, I have to say, if I can't find condensed milk, I, I shift to something else. Just the, I know that you can make a condensed milk. I think Gemma probably has a recipe. She has so many recipes on her website for making those basic things we can't find. Um, so I would Google and search Gemma's website before Perfect answer. Perfect answer. The making sweet and condensed milk. <laughs> We're in this together. I love it. Okay, great. So I'm scrolling through to see if I can get some others. So Byron asked, can you use vegan cream cheese when making a sophisticated cheesecake? You know, here's the way I'll answer that. My inclination is to say, yes, always try something. I haven't tested it, so I can't speak on authority about it. 
Um, but I definitely am wanting to and seeing more and more substitutions with, you know, using a vegan cream cheese in lieu of a traditional cream cheese. Um, so I would say try it. That's one thing in baking that in the beginning, I was so intimidated as I was learning. And I'm a self-taught baker. I haven't been to culinary school and um, I've taken classes anywhere I travel and, and from various, you know, uh, education outlets in the U.S. And what I learn is even the professionals that have done it for 20 years will tell you, try it, have fun. Mm -hmm. with it. It's not so exact. I mean, I, we all talk about, I'm, you know, I'm telling everyone today about freaking out about not having a scale and, <laughs> and laying everything down to the exact gram. But, but I also get to remind myself that even like today, I'm working with something in an environment I'm not normally in and I'm trying new things everywhere I'm going. And so if you have a restriction, like, you know, a vegan, you know, diet, then yes, try a, a cheesecake with the vegan cream cheese. And then if not, find some content creators that are in the vegan space that are experts in that. You know, I think to pretend to be the expert in everything would not do any of us any good. I can promise you that. Um, so reach out to people that are experts and they can help you. That's great. And I love your sort of creative spirit in the kitchen. You know, one of my favorite chefs of all time is Julia Child, right? And she was an expert in trying things. And I always used to love watching her videos and just like her trying and failing and learning. And that's part of the fun of being in the kitchen. So I think that's a great answer. Um, okay, let's see. So the Drippy Hundred says, what is the best pastry you recommend for Thanksgiving? Oh, you know, I, 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 I heard the question earlier for Joanne about puff pastry. Mm -hmm. um, this year, I have fallen in love with making a rough puff. So a fast mm -hmm. puff pastry that you, um, there's a few different methods using food processor or even the stand mixer with the paddle. Basically, you're just getting the butter incorporated into a dough that in a fast puff, it's a fast lamination, which is, you know, laminating is building your layers. Um, but it, it, it's a few folds in a short time in the refrigerator. And then I have been loving making bear claws. <laughs> so mm. with, um, an almond, you know, um. feeling that for, for Thanksgiving, I would even say, let's put sweet potato or pumpkin in there with some cinnamon. And then we have like a really fun autumn bear claw. So I'm loving mm. the, the rough puff and, you know, just the flaky layers that you get too. Oh my gosh, that sounds fantastic. Well, this is great. And the other thing I, I really love that you touched on, if you want to share any more thoughts, is I feel like I've seen some comments in here about aspiring bakers. And you have this amazing journey from being this you know, nine or 10 year old boy in the kitchen with your mother to being this amazing baker with a beautiful magazine. Any other words of advice to our viewers on how to sort of fulfill your baking dreams? You know, I, I always say, you know, that so often people say, I love cooking or I'm good at cooking. I'm not good at baking, but they want to be. And I always answer that by saying, yes, you can bake. And I think the biggest hurdle in baking and the biggest hurdle is wanting perfection. Mm -hmm. And don't start with croissants or macaron or something that you're setting yourself up for frustrations if you don't have the basics in the kitchen. So, um, you know, start with something like a cookie, start with, a, you know, a bunt cake or something where the pan does the, the hard work for you. And then you just get the batter in the pan and, you know, build your skills as you go and do things that you love. Um, if you don't love eating something or you don't love making it, you're never going to enjoy it over and over again. Um, so start finding those things you love. Be OK with a few failures and figure out what you did wrong and keep pressing forward. Um, you know, I think we need to talk more about the failures in our kitchens. We all have them. We post pretty photos on social media. We want everyone to see how beautiful it was. 
but there are plenty of items that I, I start with that the first round doesn't make it to a photo in the feed, but it can still be delicious, you know, and, and enjoy it too. Oh my God. Great, great advice. Well, Brian, it has been such an honor to have you with us today. And again, thank you so much for your very, very generous contribution to match donations during your time. And we are so grateful for everything that you've brought to us. And I, I hope to see you again soon. Have a safe and happy holiday. Thank you. It's been so much fun. All right. Thank you. Oh my goodness. I am so impressed by the way that man just navigated that foreign kitchen. I think we have all been in a scenario where we show up in a rental and you, I'm not only surprised by what's lacking, but the bizarre tools that are there that you can't imagine anyone using for any purpose. So bravo to Brian and his amazing skill set to be able to put together that absolutely beautiful tart under those circumstances. Um, just want to remind everybody that all of the recipes that we're sharing with you today will be posted on our website, which is nokidhungry.org forward slash bakeathon. And please remember to make a donation when you're there. You know, we are looking at record job losses and and lowered in wages and people are really suffering during these times and which makes it an unprecedented number of children who are going to go hungry right now. As I mentioned earlier, one in four kids could face hunger this year due to the coronavirus. But the good news is with your support, the No Kid Hungry campaign can make a huge difference. Through a combination of emergency grants, strategic assistance, advocacy, and awareness, we are helping kids, families, and communities, excuse me, communities get the resources that they need. And as I said, $1 donated today, just $1 during our Bakeathon can help feed a child to up to 10 meals. These are extraordinary times, friends, and during these extraordinary times, we need extraordinary generosity. Now, back to the baking. Coming up, we have a very special demonstration from Jocelyn Delk Adams of Grand Baby Cakes, and we will finish our event today with Gemma Stafford of Bigger Boulder Baking. But before that, I wanted to share a video that explains a little bit more about our work at the No Kid Hungry campaign, the crisis of hunger in America for kids, and why this mission is so important. Very rarely do kids ever say, I'm hungry. Childhood hunger is such a real thing and it is such an invisible thing. My name is Jody Walker and I run an amazing program called Kids at Their Best. There's over half the kids in our rural area that don't eat summer lunches because they depend on the free and reduced lunch program. And so we started offering mobile programs. We don't expect them to find transportation. We don't expect them to come to us we go directly to them in their area. We feed their bellies and we feed their minds and we make them feel like they're important. And the other key to our program is that our staff, they're my kids that were getting those meals when they were six years old. They're the 10 year olds that were, that were getting too old and thinking that eh, it's just not cool to go for meals anymore. So we started bringing them into leadership. They know this program inside out and backwards. It makes me feel like special, kind of like Special alert. I mean, I'm the youngest person here. I think it's cool that we can like take care of their kids, feed them, have fun with them. So I think that's really important. <laughs> Once I started working here, I was like, this is my calling. This is what I want to do. And I thought Jody gave me the opportunity to run this and she trusts me to do big things. It just amazes me and it makes me happy to know that somebody thinks that highly of me to put me in charge of such a big task. This will be our third year of coming to this program. This whole program is based around teens. It is really neat having them on site with them because they interact with the kids and my kids absolutely adore them. Being in a staff of just teens, kids connect to us a little bit more. It makes teaching, it makes doing activities, it makes just inspiring little kids a lot easier because they're connected with you. That's the whole point of our program. I mean, who knows what these kids are living through during the school year. So to be that light for these kids, I, it's just it's just such a great feeling. I mean, No Kid Hungry is literally our hero. There's an area of the community that we have always wanted to get to. These kids don't even have a sidewalk. So that was one of the things that we did with the grant. We could open doors, honestly, all over the nation. Kids everywhere need a chance and we've got a great model to show them.
Great. Well, well, I hope that that video helped share with you all the importance of our work at the No Kid Hungry campaign. I want to take a moment to thank all of the generous viewers who have contributed to us today. Thanks to Brian, we did see a boost during his event of $465. So major, major thanks, because that means that that $465 will now be doubled. And we are now at $685 raised for hungry kids across the country. So Thank you all so much for those of you who have donated. If you haven't had a chance to donate, of course it is not too late. Please consider doing so now. Every dollar counts. All you need to do is go to nokidhungry.org forward slash bakeathon and make a donation. Now, we are hoping to have another baker join us, but I believe that she is delayed. So I am going to do a little song and dance for the moment to see if we could get somebody else who is going to come up and join us um, because Jocelyn Delk Adams is our, in fact, our next, next excuse me, presenter. Um, but I think that we are a little delayed. So I'm gonna check in with my team. This is the beauty of live stream friends and see if maybe we can bring in Gemma for a little bit um, and have her join us and see if she can maybe do a little demo or answer a couple more questions while we are, um, while we're waiting for Jocelyn. So team on my end, do you think we can bring in Gemma? Maybe, um, ask, oh, Gemma, there you are. Fantastic. Hi, how are you? So, um, Jocelyn is about to log in. So I think we just maybe can take a couple of questions from sure. the group while we're waiting. And I, I have written a couple down. So, um, do you have any recommendations, and this might be something that you could post for the group, about low sugar or low fat chocolate chip cookie options? I do. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, the uh, Brian was mentioning about finding experts out there to help you with those kinds of things. And um, there are so many recipes. We have um, amazing chocolate chip cookies on our website keto ones on biggerbolderbaking.com, low sugar, low carb, and a lot of other um, keto friendly recipes. So I would say definitely check out our recipe, sorry, our website or lots of other ones out there. Okay, that's perfect. And guess what? I believe Jocelyn is here, Gemma. So thank you for Great. taking that moment with us. We're going to pull you out and then I will introduce Jocelyn. So thank you all for bearing with us. Um, so I really am excited to introduce this next baker. Jocelyn is a woman whose brand was inspired by her grandmother and she hopes to inspire a new generation of bakers and cooking enthusiasts to learn kitchen skills and not feel guilty about enjoying dessert. She is my kind of person. I have a very large sweet tooth, sweet tooth. So, so very excited and proud to introduce Jocelyn Delk Adams of Grandbaby Cakes. Hello there. Let me get in this screen. <laughs> Hi there. How are you guys doing? I'm so excited to share a super easy um, apple tart to 10 recipe that is perfect for Thanksgiving and just a great way to use apples and do something that's a little bit, you know, um, more unexpected for the holiday season instead of like your standard apple pie. So um, I've actually got some sugar going already and um, I just have like a, a half cup of um, granulated sugar here in my pan. You can use um, a cast iron pan. You can use whatever you want. And I'm just going to turn up the heat here because this is actually going to caramelize or caramelize, depending on where you're from. Um, and I let it sort of get super silky and um, delicious. And it the sugar melts down and becomes like this perfect caramel. This is a super traditional way of making caramel. And I'm just going to start to let that happen. Like, And you'll start to see that it'll stick to the pan. And you just want to keep it on the heat. I'll continue to show you guys. Um, I'm so excited to share this recipe. Uh, I wonder, I think someone will be joining me in a little bit, but um, I'm so excited to share this recipe because I make this recipe a lot. It's it's super easy. You can actually switch out the fruit and use something else if you want to. You can use um, apples like we're using. You can use pears if you enjoy that. And it's just a great holiday recipe that's just absolutely delicious and really simple to create. So as my sugar starts to melt, and I'm actually speeding this up so I can get this 
to a point where I can sort of show you exactly what's going to happen. But as I'm sort of letting my sugar kind of go around, you're going to start to see that it starts to brown and starts to melt down and liquefy. And that's like that perfect start to this recipe. While it's starting to do that, I'm going to show you guys what else you need to make this recipe. So I've got some sliced and peeled apples. And here's a trick. Like if you don't have apples at home and you want to just do something that's really, really simple, you can grab already sliced apples, like the bag of apples. It's such a great trick because... I love that they're already, you know, already perfectly diced, like perfect uniform slices of, of apple. And then also like you don't have to worry about them baking unevenly. They bake perfectly. So this is melting down. And then I have some butter. I have some heavy cream and I'm going to add some vanilla and some salt. And that's basically this whole dish. And then finally, we'll add our part um actually our uh, puff pastry. So you can get this from the store. If you are really jazzy, you can make it. <laughs> okay, if you have the time, I don't have the time, but if you have the time, you can make it yourself. And so here you'll start to see, oh my gosh, look, it's starting to form, it's starting to happen. So this is one of those recipes that I didn't learn to bake until much later. So it's something where, you know, most people, like I said, they make apple pie. It's a traditional thing that you make for the holidays. But this is just so fun. It just, it becomes something super, super special. And I actually have become such a big fan of puff pastry and all things puff pastry. And like, you know, as opposed to regular pie crust, because I love the flakiness. I love just the lift that it gets. It's so gorgeous. It, it's just really incredible. So you'll start to see, you see that that is starting to melt down. Continue to let that melt down. We're almost there. Yay. So this is wonderful. So this is getting to the point where we're going to almost add in our other ingredients and pop in our apples. And then that's really where this takes shape. So like I said, this is really melting down now. As you can see, we started with a full pan of sugar and now look what it's becoming. It's liquefying, just like I said. And it's also getting a really gorgeous brown color too, which is going to coat our apples and just make such a gorgeous, gorgeous dish for dessert. You might want to skip the turkey altogether and just eat this. You know, I won't judge you. You can totally do this. So here we are. Oh my gosh, amazing. I'm going to click over to the comments here. There we go. So I'll make sure I'll see that. So this is completely melted down now almost. You see that? Just incredible. And as we like, you want to continue to stir this. So you can get that nice, perfectly smooth caramel base, which is what we're doing here. And this is almost there. And I'm going to sort of tilt this in so you'll see this before I add the other ingredients as well. So I'm turning this heat down a little bit because what's going to happen next is going to sort of cause this entire, you know, caramel base to sort of sear. So this is what we're going to get here. Look at that just perfect. So at this point, I'm going to add in some butter and I'm going to, you know, just stir this super fast. So let that get in there and you can see that sort of searing up and bubbling. That's amazing. And then I'm going to add in a little of the cream. You can also use milk. Um, I also love to to use like whatever I have on hand. Like if you want to use like some apple cider, like you can do that too. Here's like, you know, showing you a little bit of what it's looking like. And then now I'm going to add in the apples. And the apples at this point, we're just going to let them get coated in the caramel sauce. And then it's going to start to give off some liquid as well. So you're going to see it get coated. 
and then it's going to actually loosen. So our caramel sauce was really sort of thick a couple minutes ago, but as our apples break down in the sauce, it's going to loosen up a lot. And you'll see the difference in a couple minutes. As we get those going. And this is basically it. Like, I mean, like I said, feel free, like you'll add a couple more ingredients if you want. I'll add a little vanilla in here too, you know, as this starts to cook down. A little, a lot of vanilla, it's up to you. <laughs> I actually love vanilla, like the flavor is just one of my favorite in baking. And just make sure that you're using high quality ingredients because that is like the big difference, like when it comes down to what you end up creating. So like if you use really high quality ingredients, you're like halfway home. Like you're already going to end up with an absolutely incredible dessert when you start with incredible ingredients. So it's half the battle. So this is, like I said, it's loosening up. Caramel sauce is getting much thinner as you can see. And we're just gonna allow these apples to sort of base in this. We're gonna let them base and sort of get soft and tender in our apples. And, and that's going to create really sort of like that gorgeous topping for our apple tart to 10. So this happens like you can, like depending on if like your heat is higher, if your heat is higher, this will go much quicker because this is a demo. I'm not gonna go through the entire process of cooking these down perfectly, but I'll cook them down to a point where you can sort of really see like what happens to them um, as the apples soften, which is, which is really what you want them to do. So I'll continue to sort of let this caramel bathe the apples and really let that that flavor intensify and really get into those apples, which is ugh, just delicious. I actually think I'm becoming more of a tart fan versus an apple pie fan. Like I'm thinking that this is becoming one of my absolute favorites. So, you know, it, de it depends. We've got some new comments here. Let's check them out. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Make sure that you are also donating as I'm doing this. Like, this is so important. I'm so excited to be here with No Kid Hungry. Um, they do such incredible work and they support children and just, I, I think everything that they do, making sure that our children um, are eating and that you can donate as little as literally $1 and make a difference. And that's what we truly want to support today. So please make sure that you're donating, that you're that you're really doing your part because it makes such a difference. And I'm so grateful to be here and to be able to, to do this. So um, can I use any other type of sugar? I believe they're asking for this. Um, actually, I've seen people use brown sugar, um, but for this, I really think the, the granulated sugar, it melts down so perfectly. You don't have the addition of the molasses. It really gives it a nice, you know, incredible flavor. I think, I think um, I have not tried it with a, with a diabetic sugar yet. So I have to, let me see. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah, brown sugar, I think you can definitely try this with that and see how that works. But I mostly use granulated sugar for this recipe. Um, and it just it just melts down perfectly. So as you can see, our apples, you know, they're really getting soft here. Got that nice, beautiful caramel that's like really started to develop in there. And like I said, like we won't go through the whole process, but as that continues to cook. I'll show you really quickly what to do. Like I'll use a round pan. You can also use um, a cast iron skillet. A lot of people love to use a cast iron skillet for this type of recipe. Um, I use this because it, it's really helpful in terms of making sure that nothing sticks. So I also use um, 
like a, you can use whatever brand you like in terms of a non-stick baking spray. This is a much easier way to do this. You can also do it the old fashioned way if you want to use butter or shortening and then flour it. But I find that the spray, like if you really liberally spray this, like, I mean, get in there because you want to make sure that the apples come out just just beautifully. So I get in there huge, like, I mean, spray so much on the bottom because with, with the sugars and with it developing, it, it gets a little to the point where it can sometimes stick. Oh, can you use Granny Smith apples for this? You absolutely can. This is one of those recipes that really works well with Granny Smith apples. Um, I use Golden Delicious, I think, for the uh, for this. Use, you know, really, yeah, perfect, perfect um, for this recipe. So, like I said, like really get in there, like to the point where you're almost like coughing. Like <laughs> there's so much in there, like but you need it. I promise you, you need it. So I put a lot in here, and then as our apples continue to cook they also you know shrink like apples shrink as they bake um you know which is why like if you ever baked a pie like you'll have like mounds and mounds and pounds of apples and then you'll turn around and then when it comes out of the oven you're like what what happened like what happened to everything it's because they sh they shrink yeah so this is pretty good for showing you guys exactly what's next. Um, just to show you that there our apples are. And I'm going to turn this heat off. And at this point, like, you'll you'll have your oven set. Um, I believe it's 325. It could be 375, but we have the recipe available. Don't, don't mommy brain. So sometimes you just forget. But you are now going to add your apples to your pan that you sprayed the heck out of so it does not stick. And this point, you want to, like, I like to start around the outside of the pan and then sort of go in in a decorative design. And I sort of just lay them down. So I'll show you in a second as I'm sort of making my way around. But you really want to make sure that your apples at this point, um, which tastes amazing, by the way, uh, that your apples have really started to become tender because this is not a long baking period, right? This is really sort of just to let everything meld together and to get that puff pastry to bake up super golden and delicious. And so once you get this in, oh my gosh, can you use, yes, yes, you can. You can definitely use, like I said, you can use any apple you, you really enjoy. Like there are definitely some apples that bake better than, um, than others. Like, you know, Granny Smith is a really good baking apple. Um, Golden Delicious. I love using Golden Delicious. And then if you have like pie recipes where you use like a mix of apples, this is also a great, um, this is also a great way to use a, a mix of apples. So like if you don't want to just pick one, you don't have to like, you know, go for it and, and pick more than one apple so you can get a nice difference of flavors and textures and everything is really sensational that way too. So I'll show you guys exactly what I'm kind of doing. I'm sort of working my way around the pan um, to sort of organize the apple slices. And I'll start to get this one in. And because these apples are hot, everyone's like, can we get the kids involved? Like I usually think about that process. I don't let the kids get involved at this point because, you know, the apples are still quite warm and, you know, you may need your hand to sort of, you know, organize the apples into a decorative shape how you want it to be. So I wouldn't do that. Um, for this recipe, you can use, I know this is like blasphemy, but you could totally use salted butter. I just use salted butter because that's what I had on hand. And then, so that's why I didn't add any salt. But if you use unsalted butter, then definitely add a pinch of salt into this. But it's 2020, let's sort of like skate on the rules and be rebels and you do whatever you want to do, okay? Like, don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, and then we are adding in some more of our apples here. And like, like I said before, the bag where they actually have the apples already cut down and like 
perfectly uniform, like where you don't have to make sure everything is exactly uniform. It really helps with the baking of this. <laughs> it really does because you don't have to worry about certain pieces of apple where it's like really big chunks versus like smaller chunks that will end up like not, you know, baking and getting tender enough, whereas like the smaller chunks will, right? So I'm adding in more of my apples here. And this is just such a fun, easy way to, you know, have some fun, do this like how you want to do it. I like to go around the outside and then I sort of just go in and add whatever apples I, I have left to the middle. You know, you, you can you can do whatever you want, right? Is this a filling for apple pie? Um, I mean, it could be like you totally could do this. Like, you know, apple pies, you usually add some flour. You need to sort of thicken it and, and you can sort of play around there. They're usually much more complicated than this apple tart to Tim, which is why I personally like this recipe because it isn't so fussy if you will, like it doesn't require as much. Um, you also, if you don't like to play around pie crust, this is just sensational for that because with the puff pastry, it, it's it's just flawless and easy to deal with. And so I'm just sort of adding the rest of my apples here. And then the last part of this, so I just sort of threw these in, as you can see, kind of just went around. And, and, you know, like I said, this is this is like all the good apple stuff, right? And then you're going to have some of that caramel sauce left. And I'm just going to drizzle that right over the top, over the top. And you might want to sing as you're doing this, too, because it's good to do it. All right. Get that in. That's so good. Ooh, this is so good. Yes, someone said, could you put this on top of a cheesecake? Heck yeah, you can put this on top of a cheesecake. It's fantastic on top of a cheesecake. I love that idea. Um, you know, hey, if you don't want to bake, you could get store-bought cheesecake and you could add this to the top of it and no one will be, you know, the wiser. They, they won't even know. They'll think you did such such incredibly difficult stuff and you didn't. Um, so moving on to our puff pastry. So this is just one sheet of puff pastry. I've let it sort of thaw and it's it's gotten nice and soft, um, but you don't want it to get too soft. So this one's been sitting out for a while because I was prepping for this demo, but you want it to get to a point where it's workable and you can sort of, you know, push the seams together and then we just add this right on top. So you can trim, this is one thing you can do. You can go around the corners, like you can sort of measure by looking at your round uh, round cake plate or whatever you used here, your, your pie plate, whatever you've got. You can go around the corners, you can snip this um, if you wanna make it perfectly round. I love puff pastry. I use it all, so <laughs> I just sort of tuck it in. So I'm just gonna add this right on top and I'll show you guys. I just sort of just go in and tuck it like around, just tuck it right in. Want the whole thing in there because I, I love puff pastry. Here's another thing too. Um, I'm making apple tart to 10 for the person who just got in. Um, Yes. Oh, and your name is Harmony. My daughter's name is Harmony. So hello. Um, so yes, yeah, so I just tucked this right in, as you can see, just tucked it right in. And then I'm just going to use this knife and I'm just going to poke holes in this. Poke holes like right into this. And then this is, this is it. This is pretty much it. Like you guys, we just we just basically made this. So this goes in our oven and it bakes for about, I think like 45 minutes or so, you know, give or take. You're basically waiting for the puff pastry to sort of balloon, if you will. It's going to become pillowy and, and beautiful and gorgeous and, and golden brown. And then all the apples are sort of going to even caramelize and set in more into that puff pastry, becoming one 
one situation, I guess you could say. And so when they meld together, they become family, they're cousins, they're happy, they're excited. Um, then, yes, you can use pie dough or phyllo dough. I have not tried this with that, um, but I would probably say pie dough would be a better um, a better fill-in if you wanted to use that. Um, and then also, so then when it comes out, I flip it and, and it gets like this gorgeous sort of, um, yeah, it gets this gorgeous sort of layer. And so I just, I like to sort of take whatever the remaining caramel sauce is and I just sort of just put it over the top. Like you can do that. Um, I serve it with ice cream. Uh, you know, you can, you can serve it with whipped cream. Here's um, a tip for you as well. Uh, once you are done baking it and you're ready to serve it, um, you know, you can you can let it sit for a while. But if you let it sit for like over an hour, it's basically it's basically going to set up. Right. And it's going to be harder for you to flip it and get it out perfectly. So you'll want to sort of reheat it a little bit on the bottom. And once you reheat it on the bottom, it's going to sort of soften everything, all those apples again. And then it'll be easier for you to flip it at the end, which is and, and eat it. Right. <laughs> um, for this, like I said, I used um, you can you can use salted butter. Like I said, this is 2020. Like, I don't care. You do you. You use whatever you have. You use whatever you can get on sale. You do whatever you want. Right. Um, yes, you can serve this for Thanksgiving, Jonathan. Like, of course you can. You can serve this. You can serve this for any random day. You can serve this tonight. You can do whatever you want to do. You know, um, you know, just have fun. With it. It's such an easy recipe. If you do use salted butter, like I said, don't um, don't add any additional salt to this. Just let it be. And if you use unsalted, add a pinch of salt to to your to your caramel and your apples while you're while you're cooking them. And also for the puff pastry, you can buy um, shortening based. Um, I personally love buying the all butter ones. They taste glorious with this. It, it it feels so, so decadent and rich and delicious with the all butter puff pastry, uh, just like an all butter, you know, pie crust. It, it just it just takes it to another level. So definitely think about that as well. And, and like I said, you pop this in the oven and, you know, it comes out. It's really beautiful. Once it sets up, you can add apples. You can you can really do whatever you want to do. And it's and it's really delicious. It's really delicious. Well, that's it, guys. Thank you guys so much for having me. Let me see if there are any um, any questions, uh, any other questions that have come in. Um, is there a recipe for this? Uh, yes, yes, there is a recipe for this. There's, um, I believe they have the recipe for it, but it's also on my website at um, grandbaby-cakes.com. It's apple tart to 10. Um, yes, you can add a uh, cinnamon to this. You can add nutmeg, you can ask, you can add any warm spices you want to and you know you can get something really great in oh hi Gemma. how are you doing <laughs> how are you doing i'm good i just appeared out of nowhere <laughs> I, like, I have no idea what's happening okay <laughs> how are you doing i'm great how are you i'm doing good that was gorgeous, Jocelyn. I absolutely love it. Yeah, so easy too. That's that's what I love. 2020 is all about ease. You know, do what you yeah. want, enjoy yourself. It's all good. It's um, I'm a huge advocate for store bought puff pastry, good quality, because you can buy really good quality. Yeah. I have a recipe for it, but to be honest with you, like I often buy it because um yeah. often you get like um froze it's frozen from france and it's just like amazing quality really good butter, butter. Um, butter. a little bit better than i could make myself <laughs> yeah. it's like and who has the time you know like it, it, you know who has the time get it grab it at the store save you some time and and just have a good time baking in the kitchen yeah Jocelyn, I have a question. Um, the so I'm, I'm a huge fan of a tartatan, an apple tartatan. Can you use other fruit in that recipe? Because I'm just thinking there's a lot of different stuff in season right now. 
Yes. Yeah, so um, I've definitely seen people wear uh, use pear. I've used pear because, you know, I love pear also. Um, you can also even add like cranberries in the mix. Like I've had people like make designs of cranberries with pear on the bottom and it's um, caramelized and looked gorgeous and really looked perfectly seasonal and, and just, you know, just a great dessert that looks like you took a lot of time, but you didn't. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, somebody made an, um, uh, submitted a question there, Jocelyn, about, um, I think, was it a monk fruit sweetener? They were saying, could they use it? And I just know from our experience, it's using little, yeah. monk fruit sweeteners, they don't caramelize. So they maybe don't. it wouldn't be great for that recipe. Yeah. So yes, like you wouldn't be able to put that on the burner like I did with mm -hmm. the granulated sugar and have that melt down in the same process um so so that is really the difficulty in having that substitution yeah yeah i think a coconut sugar would work well would, would that work that that caramelizes right yeah i think so like i've actually tried um coconut sugar in a lot of different capacities and i think it would probably be the safer bet yeah so jocelyn tell me um what is your most favorite thanksgiving uh memory like what what role did you play uh in the thanksgiving meal and the the whole day and the celebration I, I love to say i'm i'm you know the best eater at thanksgiving um that is my role is i come prepared um to eat everything at least like three times but um seriously like i love to um work on the desserts that's definitely my role um my family really expects me to bring the dessert um or to make it on site and this year of course it's a smaller thanksgiving like it's just mostly my immediate family but um i'm still gonna be baking pie and and getting all of that together starting tomorrow <laughs> it's funny um you know my i've always kind of expected i wouldn't say expected but i i feel like if um i bet you're the same if you bring a dessert it's going to have to be like absolutely the best dessert on the whole table oh my gosh yeah the, the, yeah everyone expects the best like you can yeah. never half step it you know with my family and bring in like a subpar mediocre dessert for the holidays yeah. it won't work <laughs> Well, I don't want to let anybody down. So like last year I made the stuffing. <laughs> I was like, everybody else can take care of dessert. I'm gonna make stuffing. I'm gonna tell you, it was delicious stuffing. Yeah, yeah. So do you have like a big Thanksgiving spread all planned? Say oh, sorry, do it say that again, um, Dawson? Big spread planned. Not this year. Um, this year, we have a lot of food, enough for an army, but it's only Kevin and I and baby George. Yeah. Um, we, we decided to cancel our trip just to just to keep everything like safe and, and keep everybody well and have everybody around for, for Christmas. So we're going to stay home for this one. Yeah. But, uh, and we don't have a family super close by, so it's just the three of us, which is going to be nice. We're, we're, we're still cooking turkey. We're still like having all the sides. Yes. enough dessert and wine for a gang and uh that's that's gonna be our thanksgiving day yeah same here same here pretty low key for us too um but there there's party of five here so my parents um will be joining my husband and i and my daughter and so and that, and that's gonna be our our low key but we will definitely be having zooms with family yeah. and you know seeing everyone far away but you know you you're so much there's still so much to be grateful for and thankful for so yeah. I, i'm still looking forward to it yeah you're dead right and that's a good um it's a good reminder about for no kid hungry that like i want to say thank you Justin, for being a part of this bakeathon yeah. today and it's such an amazing cause and for you to participate in this has been really fantastic and hopefully during your segment people were feeling extra generous and donating and uh and making a big difference because um i think you mentioned there that a dollar um really goes a, a long way and it, it, it's a uh, dollar equals 10 meals which is just yes. it's and i think yeah when i think about my morning coffee and how much that costs right so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love that because it, it makes people know that even the smallest contribution, you know, can make a world of difference in someone's life. So please definitely donate and give what you can. And I, I'm so happy that I was able to be a part of this. Yeah, thank you. And just for those of you at home, there's a link in the description box of where you can donate. Jocelyn, thanks a million. Have a lovely uh, Thanksgiving day. You as well. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jocelyn. Take care. Bye-bye. So this is um
Hello. Okay, we're transitioning over to me. Usually at this point, we would be asking Jocelyn some additional questions, but she did such a beautiful job doing that during her stream that we're going straight to me. So um, first and foremost, want to thank Jocelyn for an incredible um, demonstration. My mouth is watering. In fact, I'm very seriously considering just doing pastries and baking and just forgetting all the savory this year. It's been a weird year, friends, so maybe we just get crazy and do all sweets, although I must say I love the savory too. So, But so much good stuff to put on our Thanksgiving table this year. Um, I also want to comment on the versatility of these recipes. I think it's really great that all of our bakers so far had share, have shared recipes with us that can be swapped out. I usually go to the apples and the pumpkin, but how fun to introduce things like pear and cranberry. So I'm definitely going to be testing some of those things. Um, just a reminder, that all of these recipes will be on our website, nokidhungry.org forward slash bakeathon. Um, and I wanna just thank everybody so much for, uh, for joining and attending this incredible, incredible event. Um, I'm just so happy to continue with you on our baking journey today. But before we do, I want just to remind everybody why we're here. The holidays are not just a time to count our blessings, but it's also a time to give back. This year has been hard on all of us, I think you'll agree, but it's been especially hard on kids who struggle with hunger. I have no greater honor than being a part of the No Kid Hungry team and knowing that I'm making a difference to help feed these kids. You can be a part of that mission too. Today, by making a donation, you can help us ensure that every child in America gets the healthy food that they need. Since the pandemic began, the No Kid Hungry campaign has provided $41.5 million in grants to help schools and community groups help feed children. And this is going towards a total of more than 60 million that we hope to commit by end of year. So please do visit nokithungry.org forward slash bakeathon to help support this very important cause. A $10 gift can help us feed up to 100 meals. A $25 gift can help us connect children to up to 250 meals. So please consider even a dollar would be 10 meals for kids. So without further ado, I am now very excited to share another special surprise video from a very special guest. Hi everybody, my name's Andrew Smith. I was a finalist on the 2016 uh, Bake Off, Great British Bake Off or Great British Baking Show, but I'm also an aerospace engineer and a presenter now as well. And one of my favorite things to do is combining baking and engineering to become baconeering. So that's a lot of what I do now. Things like making a baked Alaska and explaining with it how the space shuttle re-entered from orbit. Fun things like that. But enough about me, I'm delighted to be uh, here to support the first ever No Kid Hungry Bakeathon, which is fantastic. Uh, and I wanted to give you a few tips, even though I don't celebrate Thanksgiving myself, I love uh, spreading joy and, and the good word. So I thought I'd give you three of my tips if you're baking for friends and family this Thanksgiving. Number one, buy a digital scale. Um, I know you all love your cups and everything, but a digital scale will never lie. Mass measurements are so much more accurate than volume. And uh, here's a tip. If you're measuring milk or water, anything like that, one milliliter is equal to one gram. So this is good for liquids too. Second thing is I love a microplane. So this is a really fine zester and it will only take the outer layer of the zest off. You'll never get any of that pith, but it's also wonderful if you want to level a pastry case at the end. You can just run over it with this and it's perfect. And the third thing is check your oven temperature. You can get an oven thermometer for about 10 bucks off Amazon and you'll find out what the temperature is at different bits of your oven and if it runs hot or cold, because quite often that's a typical issue. So um, I look forward to seeing your baking. Um, yeah, and we're so grateful for your support for No Kid Hungry. For every dollar raised, they feed um, 10 children, 10 meals provided, and their aim is to end childhood hunger in the States which sounds fantastic. So thank you very much. Happy baking. Lots of love from me. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. That was incredibly helpful. I have definitely been the victim of an oven that is not at the right temperature. So that's a really, really good one. Um, I just feel so fortunate, you know, as I think about how lucky all of us are to have these incredible bakers participating today. It's been so much fun to learn from you all. I'm very excited to continue this journey with you. Um, but this is a, a really special person that I am going to be introducing next. I have 
such a pleasure to introduce her. She is professionally trained chef and baker from Ireland. And don't we love a great accent? We've had the benefit of two. Um, and she wants to get you to boldly bake the best desserts, bread, and more with confidence anytime, anywhere. She is also the one who, with her partner, Kevin, was the inspiration for this amazing bake-a-thon. And you've seen much of her already, but we are so excited to announce for her official demo of the night, welcome the very extraordinary Gemma Staffer of Bigger Boulder Baking. Oh, thank you, Carla. Say more, say more of those lovely things. <laughs> That was really nice. I am thrilled to be um, a part of this. I'm delighted to be able to do it. It is um, an honor to work with you guys again with No Kid Hungry. I've worked uh, with you in the past and it is such an important organization. Now, more than ever, it is important um, to donate. There's a link in the description box so you can donate directly. I just want you to know during my food demo, I am going to be matching up to $500. So I've, there's been some amazing giving already. I want this next half hour to just knock that out of the park and we're gonna raise um, a lot of money. Just so you know, $1 equals 10 meals, which is incredible. And um, that before the pandemic, one in seven children would go hungry in the United States. But now um, with what's everything that's going on the last few months, it's one in four. And it's coming into the holidays. It's the season of giving. So it's important now more than ever just to reach in. Think about the money that you might be spending on a bigger holiday get together, maybe Christmas presents, maybe Christmas cards, whatever it is. Just reach into your pocket and um, give a little. And believe me, a little goes a long way here. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to get um, into my recipe. So um, I am going to show you. So we've seen um, some pie crusts already. We've seen some uh, different variations of apple desserts. I am going to show you how you can make a really incredible um, just an all around pie crust uh, with my secret ingredient. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. But here I have a bowl. And into it, I'm going to add in my flour. And this recipe can be found on biggerbolderbaking.com. So there we go, there's my flour. Now I'm going to add in a little bit of sugar, just a little bit of sugar to your pie crust. You don't need a huge amount. If you want to make a savory pie crust, feel free to leave that out. A little bit of salt, because for those of you who know my baking, you know that I have to have salt in there. Now, while I'm making this, get in your comments because I'd love to know whatever questions you have around the holidays, what kind of um, what kind of things you're coming up against that you know you need help with. This is what I'm here for, and um, also Joanne is here, and Jocelyn and Brian to help you with those comments. So those are your dry ingredients. Those are pretty basic, right? Those are standard pie crust ingredients. But check this out. Look at this. This is my secret weapon. It is frozen butter. So now the reason I freeze my butter is so that I can grate it into my pie crust. So you get tiny little bits of butter all the way throughout your pie crust. And um, it just makes for like really lovely flaky crust. This is my uh, little secret. What I do is I need three and a half ounces for this recipe. Here I have four ounces. What I do is I cut a little bit extra. So to protect my fingers, I use the butter wrapper like this. And then I just grate it straight into my butter. Sorry, straight into my dry ingredients like this. Look at that. Look at those lovely curls of butter. Grate it straight in there. And you want to do this kind of quickly so that your butter doesn't defrost. You know, one of the secrets of making uh, amazing pie crust is cold ingredients. And you might've heard of this a lot, um, cold utensils, even cold water, cold butter, all of that stuff is important because you want it to be cold. Joanne Chan, um, at the very first demonstration, uh, made a really good point that Butter is made up of water. And what happens is when it gets into the oven, the water evaporates. And what happens when it evaporates, it rises. So if you think of that in the pastry, it lifts the pastry, the pastry rises. And that's how you get those lovely flakes. So doing your butter in little small pieces like this will give you a lovely flaky pie crust. There we go. Now, 
if you want, you can use a vegan butter, but I know that um, they might not freeze as well. But you can always just you can always just rub that in with your hands. So as I am doing this grating here, I hope you guys are donating. There's a link in the description box. This is an organization that's very near and dear to my heart, and I've had the honor in previous years of doing a um, a bake sale with them, which was a huge success. A lot of bold bakers showed up, and uh, we sold a lot of baked goods, and that was a lot of fun. Kevin, any questions out there? Gemma, um, the purpose of salt again in your baking, can you talk about that? I think Brian emphasized it. Yes, absolutely. Look, I just wanna show you this little bit of butter I have left over. I'm going to use that in some other baking. And that's the three and a half ounces that I need. So salt in baking, really great question, really important ingredient. Salt is a seasoning. It's not just for savory, it's also for sweet. Salt brings out the flavor of other ingredients. That's its job. So it's very important to have that in your baking. And if you want to hold back a little bit on salt, maybe you want to have less salt in your diet for health reasons or whatever it is, feel free to pull back a little bit. You can always leave it out if you want to, but salt just elevates the flavor of everything else. And um, just now that you mentioned that, Kevin, I just thought of something else that um, I use salted butter. That's just me, that's my preference. I use um, Irish salted butter for obvious reasons. Um, but you can use unsalted butter either, that's totally up to you. So here I have an egg with a little bit of water and all my butter, you see that in there? All my butter is in small little bits and it's gonna add in my egg. Sometimes I hold back a little of the liquid like that, just in case I don't need it. I'm gonna add the rest of my liquid in. So when it comes to making doughs, breads, pastries, things like that, you don't always want to add in all of your liquid because you might not need it all. I'm gonna take a tip from Brian Hart Hoffman. I'm gonna go in with my hands. I feel like it's a little bit dry. So I'm gonna add in a splash of water. Now. Go really easy when you're adding in water to pie crust, and I'll tell you why. It goes back to the science that I was just talking about. Water evaporates. So if you think about it, if it's too much water in your pie crust, it'll shrink your pie crust because it'll disappear during the baking. So you just want a little bit of water to bring it together. There we go. I'm just going to, see there's a little few dry bits here, but that's okay because I'm gonna bring that together. It's going to come together. Also, um, a really good secret about pie crust is that when it rests, because you always let pie crust rest in the fridge after you've made it for at least 30 minutes, it releases liquid, so it gets wetter. So if you put your pastry into the fridge and it's a little bit on the drier side, like mine will be, it will, when it relaxes, it will release liquid and it'll get wetter. So it'll actually be the perfect texture if you just leave it a little bit on the drier side. And for anybody who's just joined, can you share what you're up to? I am. Uh, so for those of you who are tuning in and don't know me, I'm Gemma Stafford. I'm the host of Bigger Boulder Baking. I'm a professional chef and cookbook author. And I am showing you how to make a really simple pie crust. And this recipe can be found on my website. And this is all to benefit no kid hungry. So now look at this. Everybody who knows me knows how much I love this. You've got a ball of dough and a clean bowl. That is the right amount of liquid. And you can see it's a little bit dry there. Or it looks a little bit dry. It's totally not, it's perfect. So what you want to do is just wrap that up in some cling wrap or in some uh, beeswax paper. And let me see if I have some here. And then just put that into the fridge. And like I said, chill it. You can leave it, um, Candace Nelson made a really good point there. You can leave it in the fridge for uh, up to two days, I would say. Um, it's great for make ahead stuff. There we go. Just wrap it up. Um, and then just into your fridge. Really, really simple. I'm just gonna wash my hands, Kevin. You've got any other uh, comments coming in? Yeah, Jim, um, talk to us a little bit about um, what you're making for this Thanksgiving. So <laughs> what I'm making for this Thanksgiving. For, so for dessert, 
um, we went back and forth, Kevin and I, because it's a big decision, you know, like you get, you get one day to make like the best dessert you possibly can. So we are going to make um, some little kind of apple pies, a little few like pumpkin pies. What was the other one, Kevin? I have a lot of pears, pears and frangipan. Um, mostly traditionally, we're going to stick with pies. Uh, that's one of that's one of my favorites because if you're going to do pie any time of the year this is it jim do you need a lot of special equipment to get baking no you absolutely don't and actually i've got a great article on biggerbolderbaking.com about the kind of equipment and the tools that you will need to get baking um, I boil it down to you pretty much when it comes to bakeware you need six pieces of bakeware in your uh in your kitchen and um Sorry, I forgot my, my sugar. <laughs> um, so it, you really don't need that much at all. And it's, you know, it's Christmas time. It's a good time for gift giving. So it's a nice time to give people a bakeware set, replace your own. So here's what I'm going to show you now while, um, uh, while the pastry is uh, chilling in the fridge. Here we have a little bit of sugar. Now, around the holiday season, um, Brown sugar is a really popular ingredient in a lot of recipes. I don't know about you, but I literally just ran out of brown sugar. And this happens to me a lot because I don't buy a huge ton of it. What I do is I make my own. Now, um, this is um, one of my Bold Baking Basics recipes where I show you how you can make your own homemade ingredients. And that is anything from homemade cream cheese to your own condensed milk. Somebody asked earlier about making condensed milk. Uh, Brian said that, um, somebody asked Brian, I have a recipe of how you can make it and all it is is milk and a little bit of sugar. Uh, I show you how to make ricotta, I show you how to make your own vanilla extracts, all your own extracts, homemade food dyes. This is one of my recipes, how to make your own brown sugar. So here I have a little bit of sugar, white granulated sugar, and there's a little bit of molasses. And what you do is you go in with your hands, and you just mix in the molasses. Just like that. Now I'm gonna make a light brown sugar. If your recipe calls for dark brown sugar, it's very simple, just add in more molasses. And the beauty of this recipe is that you really don't need to have a recipe, just go for it, just eyeball it. You saw what I did there. Like, Depending on how much sugar you need, measure that out, add a little bit of treacle, molasses to it, and then just mix it in with your hands. So that's it if you add in a little bit. Let me show you if you want a little bit of uh, darker brown sugar. Because I know that Jocelyn had this in her recipe. And during the holiday season, you use a lot of it. And there's nothing worse than on Thanksgiving Day having to run out to get something like this when you could easily make it at home with a little bit of treacle or molasses that you have in the cupboard. There we go. Now, I hope while I'm doing all this kneading that you guys are hitting that donate button, sorry, excuse me, button. Um, I will match up to $500. That is my pleasure to do that. So I really hope you guys out there are um, also donating to this amazing cause. Gemma, Harmony uh, Humbert asks, would golden syrup do the same thing? Unfortunately, no Harmony. Um, that is, it's too pale. It's not, it's not a dark enough um, syrup. So you would need something like molasses or golden syrup. Um, sorry, oh, I'm sorry. So you need something like molasses or treacle. <laughs> um, but it's a good thought though. Like I, I know, I like where your head is at. There you go. And then just store that. You store that in um, a cup. You store that in a, like a, a jar or something like that. And then it just, you have it there forever. It will last for a very, very long time until you use it all. So that's some brown sugar. Now, I have a little trick, Kevin. Do I have time to show my trick? Sure, why not? So while I am, um, let me see. Let me do this. So here I have a cold jar. Now, Thanksgiving, I know whipped cream is a must on a lot of tables and um, also on mine. But a lot of people don't know how to make whipped cream. They don't maybe, they don't know how, they don't have a kitchen equipment or um, they're not sure what to put into it. It's really, really easy to make, uh, to make whipped cream. I'm gonna show you how you can take just a mason jar. I've got a big mason jar here. 
I'm gonna put in a little bit of whipping cream like that. Now you can put in as much cream as you want. Just know that the more you put in, the longer it will take to whip. Now my jar is nice and cold because I have to go like this and you shake it and shake it and shake it and you get whipped cream. So while I'm doing my dance, <laughs> my whipped cream dance, <laughs> I want to hear from you guys what's going on out there. What are you doing for your Thanksgiving? I've already made my uh, turkey. We're having jerk, uh, turkey confit, Kevin and I, and I got it ready so that it can sit for a few days and just get extra tasty. Gemma, Jonathan Yard asks, what are your top five dessert uh, recipes you'd recommend for Thanksgiving? Oh my gosh, Jonathan. It's a good thing I have some time. So one recipe that's on my website right now that I'm a huge fan of is um, pear and chocolate crisp. It's pears on the bottom and chocolate and, and a chocolate crumble crisp on top and with big chunks of bittersweet chocolate absolutely incredible so 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 super delicious um i'll, I'll run through these that my marmalade steamed pudding also another great one i would say any of my uh pies to use my pie crust my pecan i've got apple and cranberry on there and i've got a chocolate and pecan which is um kevin's favorite and let me see kevin what would your, your favorite be we're, we're going to do hand pies. So I've got pumpkin. hand, here's yeah. this pumpkin. I have some hand pies on the website. And that's technically what Kevin and I are doing. We're going to take that pastry. I have some apple pie filling and we are going to make hand pies. Just a lot of them. <laughs> Sounds like we're only going to have a small dessert. We're going to have a lot of hand pies. Gemma, that's a big workout there. It is, right? Can you see my guns? <laughs> I'm like jiggling all over like Santa. <laughs> Um, do you have any tips for meringues? I know it's not traditional Thanksgiving, but definitely for the holidays. Oh, I'm all about meringue. Um, I'm a huge fan of meringue. Growing up in Ireland, it was um, my mom's uh, go-to dessert. I absolutely adore it. Yes, um, around the holidays with a lot of baking, you're going to end up with a lot of egg whites. So save those egg whites, freeze them, um, or keep them in the fridge, and they will last a lot longer than you would think. Um, and they just make for a really great, fast uh, recipe for a meringue if you have egg whites just hanging around. I keep mine in the freezer, let me show you. Yeah, look at, I keep bags of egg whites in my freezer always because we do so much baking, I end up with so much egg whites. <laughs> Please don't judge my freezer. Um, but we end up with so much egg whites and I freeze them and then I make meringue because it just, it takes me, oh Kevin, I think I did it. No, a little bit more. Um, and it takes me minutes to make meringue. So that wasn't really a, that's, that's an egg white tip. I would say uh, room egg room temperature uh, egg whites and a clean bowl. Room temperature egg whites is really important. I think Gemma, I did. Um, macarons, if you don't have almond flour available. I'm gonna do a little bit more. If you don't have almond flour available, go to biggerbolderbaking.com. I've got a recipe of how you can make some almond flour. All it is is ground almonds. You do want to watch the video because you just want to be careful how much you actually uh, grind them because if you grind them too far, you're gonna end up with an almond butter. I'm almost there, Kevin. I've almost got my ripped cream. <laughs> and, and a good workout. So um, good workout. for those of you who, uh, like in Ireland, we would always have just plain whipped cream. Um, I know in America, it is um, often flavored and sweetened. And in France, they would have creme chantilly, which is with a little bit of sugar and vanilla. So if you want to add in some vanilla extract, some vanilla bean paste, which I absolutely adore, a little bit of sugar, that's totally up to you. I like to leave it plain so that whatever it is going with, you have that fat that cuts through the sweetness of your dessert rather than having sweet cream and sweet dessert. So you're just going to have that contrast. That's what I like. Gemma, there's some great comments that you don't need to go to the gym. You can just whip cream. I know, right? <laughs> Let me know. So I softly whipped this cream. So that's softly whipped cream there for you. And if you want it a little bit firmer, keep on shaking. It's really easy. And like I said, the less you put in the jar, the faster it'll be. You can always use a kitchen mixer. It's just that not everybody has a kitchen mixer to hand. So this is a great alternative. And you know, families are having smaller gatherings this year. It's only Kevin and I, so we really only need a little bit of whipped cream for both of us. And then you just store it in the fridge in your jar and you're good to go. Jim, how's our pastry looking? Our pastry is doing good. I'm just going to show you um, the last thing I'm going to show you. So you can have your pastry in the fridge. And then, like I said, used up to two days. But I don't know. Remember, I was talking about dry bits. There's no more dry bits. 
and it even I can feel it, it's a little bit wet, it's released its liquid and there's no more dry bits. So when it comes to pastry and pastry tips, uh, err on the side of a drier dough because it will just give you a better texture. It'll be uh, better to work with. It'll make for a nicer pie. So there you go. Kevin, this is gonna be for our Thanksgiving. Awesome. In the fridge. Um, so is there any questions out there? I hope people are donating, Kevin, feeling extra generous two days before Thanksgiving. So, uh, Gemma, uh, any favorite sides for Thanksgiving? I'm a huge fan of stuffing, probably because it's bread and I adore bread. I'm a huge, huge fan of stuffing. My mom growing up um, for Christmas, she would always make a sausage stuffing with onions and sage and sausage meat and bread. And that's what I'm making this year. I adore stuffing. And then also, I think, um, Kevin, what else are we having? Like carrots. We're having kind of standard. One side dish that I'm making this year that is not really a traditional um, Thanksgiving dessert or dish is potato gratin as garlic scalloped potatoes, uh, uh, potato dauphinoise, whatever you call it. So it's just a big dish of potatoes, thinly sliced and then cooked in like garlicky cream deliciousness. And that is exactly what I'm having. Will I show you Kevin the turkey? Will I show you the bring in the turkey? Okay, let me show, I'll bring in the turkey over here. So, this is, uh, <laughs> I just want to note, this is for two people. <laughs> it'll last us a while. This will, it'll definitely two it's days. Um, I went to the butcher. I didn't want um, to spend $60 on turkey when it's only Kevin and I. So I went to the butcher and I got some drumsticks and some wings. And I confied these. I brined them yesterday. I brined them overnight. A little bit of salt, sugar, and garlic. And left them in the fridge. Then I just confied them in a big vat of oil, duck fat, clarified butter. And what it does for, for uh, it's a deep fat fryer for all the world. It slowly cooks um, and tenderizes and breaks down your meat. So you end up, I'm, I don't want to, let me see if I can show you. Um, you end up with this incredibly, I think I had one there, right? This incredibly, look at that, in tender meat. So what I'm going to do is we're going to put those back into the fat that I cooked them in and um, then take them out on Thanksgiving Day. Our turkey is already done, so I don't need to have space in the oven for it. And then I do my dauphinoise and my carrots and my stuffing and all that. I should mention that um, in Ireland, when I trained to be um, a chef, I trained generally as a chef, and then I specialized in pastry. So I do know how to cook <laughs> as well as bake. B baking is just is, is my absolute passion, but um, I can also cook, so that's good. Yeah, just one last question here from Jonathan Yard. He's been a loyal viewer throughout. Uh, is about your um, stuffing. Can you use challah for stuffing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I made a video recently about making um, breadcrumbs for stuffing, and I would just say you can use any bread you want. You can use croissants. You can use challah. You can use a brioche. Um, you can you can use sourdough you can use a ciabatta just make sure whatever bread you're buying uh, makes sense with the dish that you're going to use it in so um i wouldn't make uh let me see i wouldn't use croissants to make stuffing because it's too sweet and buttery or whatever cross or sorry um hala will absolutely work for um for stuffing or something like that what might be even a little bit better would actually be just a plain loaf of white bread and even for something like a stuffing if you were to get like italian uh, style bread with herbs and garlic and stuff in it that would make your stuffing like even better so just make sure it matches whatever you're going to use it for joanne 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 is here She's coming up. <laughs> I think Joanne. Hi, Gemma. In. Hi, Joanne. Hello. Man, I loved watching you demonstrate that pie dough and the whipped cream. I've never seen whipped cream like that. That was so cool. Well, I love Joanne, that. I'm kind of a genius. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely are. And you know what, Gemma, what I love is that you have the same approach to baking that I do, which is it's not supposed to be hard or daunting. It's supposed to be something that is fun and that you can do at home. And if you have if you have a mixer, great. But if you don't have a mixer, here's what you can do. If yeah. you have brown sugar, great. But if you don't have brown sugar, here's what you can do. And I love that you're making baking approachable because I yeah. think you and I share the same philosophy. For that sure. it's just it, it it's so much fun, and you don't want people to be to shy away from it. 
No, it's, so, it's, intimidating. And and it's great cool. to hear that from another professional chef as well, because um, it, it's, it, is, it is a science, but it's not rocket science. And, you know, it's exactly. just a sport fun activity and no one's going to look forward to baking if they're worried about like you know having to follow so many rules and you know so exactly. like I try to make it as accessible as possible on bigger boulder baking i always tell people follow the recipe as written the first time and then make it yours do whatever you want and sometimes i'll have people write to me and say okay i did this to the recipe and i didn't do this and i baked it for 10 minutes longer or you know half an hour shorter it tastes good, but what did I do wrong? <laughs> I'm like, if it tastes good, then you did everything right. You just didn't, you know, maybe your oven was a little bit different or your ingredients were a little bit different. So I'm yeah. thrilled that um, that we're getting more people baking. That was fabulous. And I want to eat some of that turkey. That looks so good. <laughs> that good? Can you believe that's oh. for two people, Joanne? That is, um, I don't know, like like eight pounds of turkey and it's for my husband. And nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's fabulous. That's fabulous. Um, I would love to find out how you got inspired to learn how to bake. Like, what is your trajectory and what got you into this this field? So, um, um, for those of you who don't know, so I'm originally from Ireland, Joanne knows that. And um, I learned from my mom. My mom, um, still to this day, is probably one of the best cooks and bakers that I know. She was a fantastic role model. And getting like such great food at home really inspired me to um, to want to to start baking. I started baking at a very young age. Started making a lot of um, breads, a lot of um, what we would call in Ireland buns, which are just cupcakes. But it's like every every kid's rite of passage in Ireland to make buns. You start from there, and then you progress on to other things. But I've always just been fascinated with baking, and I would just say food in general. And um, I spent like my childhood going through all my mom's magazines, all my mom's cookbooks, and just like thumbing, like even just like thumbing through the things, make adding to my list of things that I wanted to bake. But um, my mom never made it look hard, Joanne, and I think that was what was really um, what like clinched it for me was that this isn't a difficult thing to do. It's quite easy. My mom comes in and she whips up a dinner for her family of seven people and she does it in half an hour and it's uh she just never made for want of a better word she never made a meal of it and uh if for like watching that it just seemed accessible and easy and uh so that's so it was i kind of knew very early on i said to my mom that i wanted to either be a teacher or to be a chef and my mom uh said to me in ireland you have to fill it you fill out oh gosh trying to remember the name of it um, a form to go to college. And I said to my mom, I wanted to be a chef. And she said, if you become a chef, <laughs> Joanne, you might empathize with this. If you become a chef, you're gonna work very long hours. Yeah. Um, it's gonna be a very hard job and you'll probably earn very little money. <laughs> <laughs> so here and we are. Was, for, for the majority of my career, she was right. <laughs> but I still did it, but I, I still was really passionate about doing it. I'm still as passionate today um, now moving out of professional kitchens and taking my expertise online, um, on where I'm bigger, bolder baking, we have almost 8 million fans uh, worldwide. Amazing. Um, Amazing. Hundreds of, over plus 500 plus videos, hundreds of recipes on my website. And uh, this is, I think my whole career uh, has been working up to this point of now I actually am teaching and cooking, which, uh, exactly. which is, is kind of exactly where I want to be. It's so wonderful. You wanted to do two things and you're doing both things. That's really, that's really amazing. It's awesome. So I know you've been saying um, over the last couple of hours that you didn't grow up with Thanksgiving. Um, so how have you, uh, how have you made Thanksgiving your own now that you've been here for about 12 years? Like what are the Thanksgiving traditions that you've developed and that you love the most? So um, for Thanksgiving, I was mentioning to Jocelyn that I don't always do dessert because it's kind of expected or, um, you know, I don't, if other guests are bringing dessert, I don't know about you, Joanne, but when other guests are bringing dessert, I tend to shy off and bring something different because Agreed. if somebody went to the trouble to make something homemade, I don't want to show up and just like put my dish down and like think it's, and everybody like, you know, might go towards that. So right, what I like right. to do is um, I make stuffing. 
I make bread rolls. Um, my niece and uh, Kevin's uh, niece and I make bread rolls every single year, and that's really fun. I generally go towards something carb heavy, but okay. um, the Thanksgiving is a little bit different this year because I have now a, a nine month old baby. So, you the know, the cutest little, Georgie's the cutest little baby. <laughs> Those and, eyes, oh my goodness. Gorgeous. I don't know where, yeah. And the blonde, and the gorgeous. golden blonde hair. I don't know where I got that baby from. But anyway, <laughs> you know, we're going to now probably do more of our own Thanksgivings. For the last few years, we right. traveled to Kevin's family up north in California. I'm, I'm in Los Angeles. And um, we're like, but now with George, we're going to start to like build our own traditions and things here. So I do tend to go for the pumpkin pie and things like that when it comes to Thanksgiving because you only get it once a year. So I do, I'm a little bit of a smoker for like, you were saying you guys are cranking out pumpkin pies right now. Like I am, I am a, a huge fan of pumpkin pies. Agreed. You know, every Thanksgiving um, we, we roast a big turkey. Uh, you know, I didn't grow up with turkey. I grew up with duck, but since as an adult, I've, I've really grown to love turkey. And after Thanksgiving, I always say to my husband, Christopher, we should have turkey all the time. It's yeah. so good. I like it. I love it. Um, I would love to know uh, what are your biggest baking mistakes that you can remember? Any any crazy stories you have to share with everybody? That's a really good question. My biggest baking mistakes. You know, um, I I have my fair share of mistakes. I'll tell you, Joanne. We answer. Um, hundreds of comments coming in on uh, social media on our website and everything every week. And I read a comment and they say, um, I made your pastry and this happened. What did I do wrong? And I, I have become an expert in answering them because I've done all, whatever you did wrong, I've done it. <laughs> I've done it all. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I've, I'm try, I've used hot chocolate powder as a, as a little kid I've used hot chocolate powder instead of cocoa powder thinking it was the same thing you know I used to bake with margarine because my mom took away the butter from me because it was uh, more expensive than margarine so expensive right until I, until I kind of got wise to her and then I went back using her butter <laughs> again but I've, I've done I've done everything I've seen it all I have been um professional chef for 15 plus years so um yeah I, I've done it all I'd say the biggest ma baking mistakes, there's something that's coming to the front, top, front of my brain. There is one thing with, um, similar to a yellow cake here, we do a Victoria sponge. Mine tends to dip in the middle. Mm, and right. thinks, like there's no, no other word for it. And what I've done previous years is put cream inside and then just fill it up with flowers and, and strawberries right. and stuff. But it, it, it legit has a big hole in it and I have no idea why. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep on making the same hole. <laughs> I've done that before where my cakes have a divot and but I still need to assemble them and I think I'll just fill it with and cover it in buttercream. But then you realize that when you slice it open, you can see the yeah, divot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah oh, well. just hopefully you're you're um, long gone by that stage, John. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, I think my one of my biggest um, baking mistakes happened actually at Thanksgiving, and this was probably about 15 or 16 years ago when we were baking um, hundreds of pumpkin pies for Bostonians. And uh, we had a recipe that measured nutmeg, freshly grated nutmeg by the tablespoon. And so we used a microplane, um, oh, yeah. like Andrew was saying, you know, a microplane makes quick work of yeah. uh, of grating nutmeg, it's so easy and it makes it light and fluffy. And so we measured, you know, however many tablespoons for that pumpkin pie batch. Um, and then I went home and I gave the task to another baker and rather than use the microplane, he put the nutmegs into a food processor. Food processor. And I knew you were gonna say that. Oh, and so it made it like really, really compact. And then he measured the tablespoons and we made dozens of pumpkin pies that were so spicy, we couldn't eat them. Oh, and we woke up that, you know, when I came to work the next morning and tried it, we were like, what are we going to do? And so we had to run around like crazy and make new ones. But that's something that was just, I, I will always remember that. It was very scary. <laughs> to be fair, so, I guess where they were coming from, it kind of makes sense to like absolutely. process nutmeg. 
yeah, kind so of. much faster. <laughs> well, I think he thought this will be so much faster. I'll just put all the nutmegs in a food processor and press go, and I won't have to stand there. Oh my gosh. He never made that mistake again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, you don't. You, 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 uh, you learn that the, the hard way. You only make it once. Inspired by you and Kevin, and I wanted you to offer to match all the donations up to $500 as well. I think we have such an opportunity here to raise so much money for No Kid Hungry, and I have loved, absolutely loved, doing this bakeathon with you, and I'm so looking forward to doing this again next year, um, oh and I'm gosh. really hopeful that we can continue to stay in touch throughout the year because this has just been tremendous. Joanne, Thank that you. is amazing. I'm not gonna do math on camera because I learned that's the wrong thing to do, <laughs> but 500, uh, if we talk about one, dollar equals um 10 meals then 500 dollars exactly i was meals Kevin? <laughs> many <laughs> many many <laughs> it's a lot of meals <laughs> it's a lot of meals it's a lot of meals <laughs> that's amazing so, that's really john that's oh that's lovely it's made my day that's really really generous thank you so much thank you so much this has been tremendous thank you thank lovely you. Uh, take care Hey everyone, uh, this is Debbie Shore, co-founder of Share Strength and the No Kid Hungry campaign. And my God, I just learned so much uh, from these last few hours. And I just wanted to thank everyone uh, for, for taking part in this, especially to Gemma and Joanne, who I learned a lot about my very favorite food, which is butter. So learning about what happens in the oven with the evaporation and, and how to, um, I love that trick of putting the butter in the freezer. That was so great. So thank you both for jumping in when we asked you to do this uh, and jumping in with both feet and both hands and just um, doing such a great job helping us build this first bake a for No Kid Hungry. And I wanna thank Brian uh, and Jocelyn for also sharing their uh, incredible baking talents with us today. And, and also Candace and, and Andrew for their tips and through their videos. And one thing became clear to me today was that the, the, um, the, the, the core value of Share Our Strength is alive and well. When we started this organization, we knew that um, people finding a way to share their strength and their passion, both of which all the chefs uh, showed us today, would really yield you know, real benefits for people in need. Uh, and that was really clear today. So most of all, I want to thank everybody who donated today. Um, all of our guests were fabulous in talking about the $1 connects a kid to, to 10 meals. I'll just mention a few other things that we know we're going to be able to do with these funds that are raised today. Um, as, as Carla mentioned, we've raised millions since this pandemic, and we're going to do another $30 million in grants uh, and other supports before the end of this year. So we're making grants in all 50 states to food banks and schools and community organizations. Um, more than 1,500 organizations across the country are getting grants and support to help feed kids and families in their community. And, and I would say in addition to the, the funds, which are critically important. The other really important piece that helps kids and their family is the work we've been doing with Congress to really uh, expand benefits for families so that they have flexibility to feed their kids, not just in school that day, but to be able to pick up food for the rest of their family on weekends and more than just one family member. So these are all really important things and all things that we're gonna be able to do with the funds that are raised today. We're also, we've got a, a map, an interact, interactive map on our website. It helps families find out where they can get free meals. So um, everyone did a great job. Carla, thank you for being uh, just a wonderful, um, uh, engaged hostess today. You are terrific. And uh, Kevin for helping us build this and to all of the chefs and everybody who participated. And you know, just for uh, everyone at Share Our Strength, and the No Kid Hungry campaign and the community that we serve. We are uh, really grateful for this and we, we hope to do, get, do it again next year. So everyone have a safe and healthy Thanksgiving and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. When COVID-19 hit and all of our schools shut down abruptly, my first concern was Rebecca and I knew she was gonna have a hard time with food. With this pandemic that's going on, it's not safe to go out and get food with five children. We count on a lot of the juice and milks. We count on a lot of that. Thank you. My grandchildren are my everything. Before the coronavirus pandemic happened, they ate breakfast and lunch at school. Then one day they just said no school. We were stuck. We didn't know what to do. 
It wasn't enough food to feed them all day and all night. The free meals we got saved us. El programa está muy bueno para los muchachos que están en casa para ayudarles a sentirse como que están en la escuela con la comida que le dan. Es una ayuda también para el hogar. Without this type of help, we would not have been able to come through the things that we've come through in the last month. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for the food. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for being kind. And for the apples. Make sure you put that apple thing. <laughs>